What's up, guys? It's yo boy I'm the sensei back with, Reborn as the Ant King in MHA. MHAX Solo Leveling. Part 3. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. This really helps with the algorithm. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. POV, All Might. A child. Abandoned by his parents, hated and persecuted for something that is completely outside of his control. Kidnapped and left to die on a mountain, miles away from any civilization. Left to fend for himself from a fragile age. In his early life, he had no adult he could trust. He was always alone. Then, he was miraculously found, having broken up a bank robbery at the age of five. He was sent to a special orphanage. Only for the police to later find out that the orphanage owner worked with a certain ring of human traffickers. They were too late to help the child, once again. How many times has our society failed him? I am ashamed of having injured Beru. But it seems he was able to recover properly from it. Even when he was injured, he didn't seem to have any reaction to it, he has been dealt an unfortunate hand in life. But it seems like he hasn't let that keep him down. He should be 15 years old this day. His quirk may make him look different, but he is still a child. And here we are, vilifying him on the news. It doesn't matter how many statements I make, the public was hellbent on believing that Beru is not a safe individual. But his latest action seems to have changed the perspective of the public quite a bit. He fought and took down a villain that was terrorizing a village, and that almost killed a team of heroes. Even though he is hated, even though everyone seems to look at him with fear and disgust there he is, saving a hero without asking for anything in return. Even after going through all of that, his heroic spirit is still well and alive, I cannot help but feel shame shame at not being able to save this child, I am not naive enough to believe that I can save everybody, but he was there. He was in my reach. And I didn't do anything. He is driven by something, be it revenge for his captors, or the society that wronged him, but he will get it before he allows himself to get caught. At least that's what I understood from his words. I doubt I can catch him with my current state, he is young and is only going to grow stronger, I am already becoming weaker. There isn't enough known about his abilities to understand and counter them. It was only recorded as having unnatural strength, flight, sharp claws and a tough exoskeleton. But he seems to have so many more abilities. From that extension of his claws to tail growth to the odd way his arms gain mass when he winds up his punches, there is not enough information to combat him effectively. So. Here I am pathetically waiting for him to turn himself in this is one of the times where I regret being as weak as I am. I can only hope he is not in any danger. POV Baru well, killing muscular was fun. Shigaraki wasn't really interested enough in the details to realize I had saved a hero. He was too busy playing his games. All for one did notice it though. I could hear his conversation with Kurajiri. Was this truly due to your command to him master? Asked Kurajiri, his suspicion of me is quite well founded. He's spent the most time with me, he can likely tell that I am a bit more intelligent than I let on. I may be a decent actor, but I do slip up from time to time. It must be, he has developed more and more intelligence as time passed, but he is still fiercely loyal. If I told him to avoid unneeded casualties, he will all for one is just as arrogant as ever it seems. I do not doubt you sir, but it still strangely irks me, he said, still wiping that on whiskey glass, while looking at the table. Then, perhaps we can give him a mission. One that will erase any trace of doubt. Make him hunt down and kill the same hero he saved. All for one seems to be just as cold as usual. I should have expected something like this to happen, but I won't kill that dude. I don't care what all for one believes about it. If need be, I will hasten my plans. I am sure I can kill all for one as I am NOW although, I doubt it will be easy. There is no need for that master I trust your sound judgment, it seems Kurajiri is unknowingly doing me a solid here. Very well then. Do watch over Shigaraki will you? He's been a bit more irritable lately probably due to those games he always plays geez, didn't know all for one was such a boomer. Herder, video games bad. Didn't know he was in parent advice Facebook groups. I guess that's where he takes his advice from. Is it really hard to believe that Shigaraki is just a piece of shit? I mean, he may not need to be one. Maybe he was a nice kid at some point, but he's not anymore. He's an adult, he should be able to take care of himself. At his age, I was already the boss's right hand man. Making deals with other large gangs and taking down smaller ones by myself. 
Holy shit am I also becoming a boomer comparing the younger generations to myself and complaining about how I was better and shit oh no, I am still too young to be a boomer you know, this would be a great time to get drunk, but I can't really. Kurajiri already finished his conversation with all for one, while I was contemplating my age. I walked to a corner of the bar and started throwing darts. It was a lot better than not doing anything. Although I always run out of space on the bullseye. I think I will go and train my quirks for a bit tomorrow. I need to test out the combinations that I can make with Muscular's quirk. It should be quite extensive, it was a really versatile quirk after all, even if the previous user wasn't all that keen on experimenting much with it. Muscular's quirk gives me complete control over my muscles, and only using this ability to give myself physical power would be an insult to my intelligence. I don't plan on doing anything today. I've had my fill. I will just laze around the bar. POV Baru okay, so there I am, training my muscle quirks and admiring the gold I G-A-T-H-E-R-E-D stole. Kinda Scrooge McDuck like, I visit my little stash of treasures daily. Just to look at it and wonder why the fuck I even bothered keeping them. I mean, it's not like I can even wear rings, and gold necklaces don't really match my black exoskeleton all that well. I guess it was more of an impulsive move, like B-U-Y-I-N-G or stealing, an engagement ring for a hooker. That may be an odd analogy, but I did see a few guys do that. It always ended up in divorce. The guys likely just tried to be saviors or whatever, whisked them away from a life of prostitution. But it was usually done with the wrong women. As a lot of them did things willingly. It was easy money. And yes, my gang obviously ran a few brothels. It's highly profitable and there's no reason not to run them. We did have a certain set of rules for them. Members of higher ranking would also often look at the way they were being run. Now that I think about it weren't we more of a crime syndicate than a gang? We never really gave ourselves a formal name either. The members in the primary CIRCLE nearest to the boss also includes me, were called the Californian Killers by the public. We weren't really a friendly bunch now that I think about it, and I think the gang was actually called something like the Dirty Rats it was a stupid name that VLADISLAV the boss found amusing. It was also a bit fitting considering our expansionist business practices. We did take out our competitors through underhanded means and were even proud of it. Well, enough thinking about my old gang. Some interesting things are happening right now. Like this random kid that just stumbled upon me. He is really small, I think he's around 3 or something. He's got short spiky black hair and a red cap on his head. What is a kid doing in the middle of the woods? Are his parents irresponsible enough to let him wander off like this? He looked a bit scared at first, but then he looked happy? Mr. Bug? Great, he both insulted me and screamed out in a manner I find innocent and cute. Thank you for saving my parents. He bowed a bit. I mean, that's cute and all, but what's this kid talking about? I think you've got the wrong person, I said in a confused tone. Think, who did I save recently there was that couple in that car a few years back, but they were just horny young adults. And why are they the first people that came to mind? Am I an idiot or something? Likely, the hero couple should be the most obvious option. Then, I guess that woman was a MILF no. You saved them from that big villain holy shit kid. No need to scream it out. You'll wake up the birds or something. What's your name kid? I don't want to call him kid the entire time. Oh. My name is Kota Izumi. He greeted with excitement. Oh why are you here? It seems my mouth finally decided to ask something useful. Good job mouth. Oh. I'm staying with my cousin while mom is helping dad recover. Great, well the kid seems to be a chatterbox. Are you lost? My question seems to embarrass him a bit. It's a bit odd for a three-year-old to come all the way here unsupervised, though yeah, we were playing hide and seek. I wandered off a bit. But my cousin and her friends will find me quick. His smile is really odd to look at. Why is he so happy about getting lost? Do you need help? Is a genuine question anyone should ask a child they find lost in the woods. I should know, I was one. And while I didn't really need any help surviving, a foraging guidebook would have been helpful. No, my cousin and her friends must already be looking for me. I'll just wait near here. Great, now I need to keep an eye out for this kid too. Mister. Why is everyone calling you a villain on the news? You are clearly a hero. God help me. Why am I talking to a three-year-old? I am not really a villain but I wouldn't call myself a hero either my answer seemed to be somewhat confusing to the kid. I don't get it but I want to be like you when I grow up. Oh lord, that's not a good idea. I mean, I get that he's happy to meet his parents' savior, but it would be a bit irresponsible of me to just encourage him to become a crime-fighting and oddly dressed hero, but then again, his parents are also heroes, maybe they can train him or whatever. Sure kid you will be a nice hero, now leave me alone so I can admire my jewelry in peace. Wait, didn't he say someone was supposed to come for Hai? didn't even get to finish that thought as the earth underneath me gave way. 
It was an odd feeling, kinda like climbing up a staircase at night and forgetting how many steps there were, taking one in empty air and panicking for a second yeah, that's the same feeling. But I have wings now. So I just floated in place as the ground underneath me formed a whirlpool. I quickly grabbed Koda, who was being pulled away by the earth. I don't really know who this is, but I'm not about to let a kid get dragged around by dirt hands. Whoa. We're flying. The kid got excited really quickly. Let go of the child, villain. Shouted an oddly dressed woman. She's got short hair, she's wearing cat large cat paws oh. Auntie. I'm flying. Well, calling her auntie might be a bit much Koda. I think this is her cousin, to be honest, don't worry Koda. We'll rescue you soon. What? Do they not recognize me or something? I saved this kid's parents like a day ago I landed in front of the woman, she was startled. Then, something even more bizarre appeared. A burly man wearing similar clothes and paws as Koda's cousin, just appeared from a bush wait what? Why is he wearing a skirt? He quickly tried to take Koda away from me, but I don't know if it's safe for him to be touching kids, so I didn't let him do that. Stop, I said. And to my surprise, they actually stopped. That usually doesn't work. Take care of the kid you idiots, was all I said as I held him up to her cousin. She took him from me, a bit confused. The guy also scratched his head a bit. Why are you cosplaying in the middle of the woods and not taking care of the kid? I started scolding them as any responsible adult should in this situation. My scolding continued for a bit, as the two of them watched me a bit flabbergasted. Two more women came out of the woods to watch with the same shocked face. Koda seemed to be having a bit of fun, but he didn't really understand a lot of what I was telling the heroes. I even threatened to call Child Protective Services. One of them finally had the courage to speak up after my long tirade. Um aren't you supposed to be a villain? A blonde woman with long hair, wearing similar clothes to the cousin. I think these guys might be a group of heroes or something. What? No, he's a hero. He saved mom and dad. Koda looked a bit annoyed at his cousin's friend. Then I could see them look at me for a bit, taking a pause. Their eyes widened at the same time. Oh said the cousin. W well, we're sorry. She bowed a bit. At least she's polite about it I turned around to leave, I also need to find a better place to hide my stash. But I can do that later, it's not like they'll randomly start checking tree barks in the area. Wait. Um thank you for saving Koda's parents. She bowed again. I think they are also a bit confused about what to do in this situation. I think their job is to catch me, but they clearly don't want to. As I help someone close to them. So they'll just watch me fly away, I guess. Whatever. I need to go to the bar anyway. The drama Kurajiri always watches will begin soon, and I don't want to miss an episode already. POV narration The wild wild pussycats were left a bit confused by their strange meeting with the most infamous and controversial villain in Japan. They were just playing around with little Koda, they obviously used Ragdoll's quirk to constantly keep an eye on him. Koda was never in any danger, the heroes let him wander off for him to have some fun. They knew the child liked exploring the forest. And Koda hadn't even wandered that far off before he had met Beru. And the heroes instantly noticed their meeting and tried to find an opportunity to separate Koda from him. They didn't recognize him at first, somehow, but Tiger and Mandalay did recognize him after coming closer to him. Still, they wanted to keep Koda away from him, as the man was still a villain. They didn't know much about the situation with Koda's parents. They had just heard that the two were dealing with a villain and that Beru also happened to hunt down that villain. Koda's parents also didn't really go into detail about the way that Beru had helped them to the wild wild pussycats. Since they were still on the mountain training when that happened they weren't keeping track of all the news. They just accepted to take care of Koda momentarily. Still, their encounter with Beru was a bit embarrassing. Mandalay was having a hard time looking the insectoid in the eye as the villain actually started scolding the heroes for child negligence. It went as far as him threatening to inform the authorities of it. A villain. Unironically threatening to call the cops on heroes. The wild wild pussycats could only stand there and stare blankly at the oddity of the situation. The villain turned to leave after placing Koda on his feet and giving him a small push. It was bizarre to see Mandalay's young cousin idolize a villain. Mandalay still stopped him from flying away to thank him for saving Koda's parents. Even if she didn't really know the full situation yet. This villain was a lot more like a jaded cop or a retired hero. He seemed to be both bad and good. On one hand, he had no qualms about killing other villains. He had yet to murder any heroes, but he had injured a few, including the symbol of peace and endeavor. On the other hand, he seemed to be oddly protective of children, he had reportedly saved people before, including the water hose duo. Later, Mandalay started looking a bit into the situation. She managed to find a few reports of the villain carrying Koda's father all the way to the hospital. 
That came as a shock to her, as it seemed the news stations were deliberately trying to be vague about the situation to avoid painting Beru in too positive a light. Mandalay found it weird. But she couldn't really do anything about it. Besides, there were already a lot of people that had seen the same articles she had. Those that reported fairly on the situation and gave the gist of what happened. Slowly, those people would spread the word of the true nature of this villain. POV Beru ha, I wonder if it's safe to let the kid go with those people. But Koda did seem to know them, and he said they are his relatives, so he should be safe. I don't really feel like training right now, this whole encounter really took the wind out of my sails. Kurajiri's favorite drama is also on hold as some other bullshit urgent news is happening. Some villains attacking a mall somewhere around Musatafu. A burglary turned into a hostage situation. And guess who needs to go deal with that? Of course, no one other than me. Why? Because Shigaraki was also planning on watching the episode. And I really wonder if I will get any fun missions. Really, I've had a few calm months, and now missions are coming back to back. I barely had the time to drink. I just killed muscular yesterday so anyway, I flew to the mall. I might as well check the situation first. It seems like a few kids are playing hero during a hostage situation. Well, there's two of them. They seem to be quite young though. Should be in middle school or something, they look like 13 or 14. A guy with black spiky hair that seems to have some sort of hardening quirk and a girl with pink hair and pink skin, she's also got antennas on her head. She seems to be throwing acid at the burglars. So I guess her quirk has something to do with that. How do I know it's acid? Well, it's melting the fucking ground. I don't really know how often this happens, but I don't really like seeing kids take on criminals. It's only okay when I do it, the guy seems to be a bit of a coward though, he's just running around as the villains try to shoot at him. The girl is also just throwing around her acid like it's water. She's melted the ground in several patches. But only managed to touch around two villains. And the group of villains has at least 16 people in it. They seem to have varying quirks, mostly violent. They are also using guns. Something that reminds me of good old America. I guess gun laws being strict in Japan doesn't really matter to criminals I mean, most of the villain gangs I've seen have fire weapons. And this particular group seems to have injured quite a few people in the mall. The police are likely hesitant to enter because of the possibility of more civilians being injured. They likely don't know that a few kids are stirring up trouble. I think they will rush the building soon though, as the sound of gunfire won't just fly over their ears. But, while the guy will likely be fine, the girl doesn't really have any resistance to bullets, and she's about to get hit by one. Well, she would be hit by it if I wasn't here. I appeared in front of her. Neither the villains nor the civilians could follow my movements. To them, I just appeared in front of the girl as the roof above their heads cracked and the ground quaked a bit. The bullets just bounced off my skin harmlessly. The villains were instantly spooked by my appearance. I think I can see some recognition in their eyes. Heh, I'm famous after all. I could also hear the girl behind me give a small yak. And surprise. I looked back at her, there was little fear in her eyes. She didn't seem all that disgusted by my appearance. But then again not everybody is, I guess I did just block a few bullets for her and, it's not like she didn't see them rolling on the ground after hitting my abdomen. You kids should stay back, I said with a calm voice. The hardening quirk teen was still being chazzed around. He was running around on the upper floor of the mall. I flew and grabbed him too, the villains chazzing him were left wondering where their target had disappeared. I dropped the boy near the girl. The boy was confused at first, looking around all confused. He finally gave off a girlish scream when his eyes finally landed on me. I looked the girl in the eye a bit, she seemed to just sigh in relief and sat down on the floor. The boy on the other hand a villain p please don't hurt us. He may be a bit too panicked to read the situation properly. The girl just looked at her friend and shook her head. Thanks, mister is all she said. She looked at me with gratefulness. I guess she's not one to judge by appearances. Now, while this was happening the villains regrouped and prepared to come towards me. I don't really get why they think this is a good idea. My antennas danced around in the wind as I was hunched a bit. My hands were just hanging by my sides, I stared at the approaching villains. My gaze was enough to make most of them flinch. Now, I kinda wanted to just dismember these idiots and be done with it. But I don't want to traumatize these kids. Mister. We are honored to meet the arch nemesis of the symbol of peace in person. One person in the group stepped forward and bowed his head. Would yo he was about to continue speaking, probably emboldened by my lack of adverse reaction. Not interested I don't know what he wants to sell, but I ain't buying it. I dashed towards them, most of the gunmen were embedded into the concrete floor before they even realized I had moved. Only one man was spared. And two of the gunmen got back up. I guess they have endurance quirks one of them seemed to transform his body into a rhino, he tried to rush me and impale me with his horn. I just grabbed his horn with my hand and lifted him by it. 
smashing him into the other people that were still standing. After that, I just dusted my hands as the police entered the mall. They were a bit shocked to see the chaos that was around. I simply flew away, the police didn't bother stopping me as they quickly transported the injured to ambulances and hospitals. The situation ended quickly, but I can't really complain since they weren't really interesting villains. They were just two bit thieves with guns. POV narration Mina was not having a great day. First, she finds out her exams were a bust, then the mall she was trying to buy clothes from gets raided by villains. She first started complaining to her friend, then the villains heard her and got mad. She, however, wasn't scared by them. Even taunting them and whatnot. It was only after the fight started that she realized she could be in grave danger. She had also put Kirishima, her friend, in danger. Especially since the skinny black-haired teen was not a fighter. He could just run around and block attacks with his body. Mina herself didn't really know how to fight. She was just throwing her acid around and hoping to hit the villains. She thankfully didn't injure any civilians, but the villains were also not really affected. Even if Baru considered them trash and two-bit thieves they were still a dangerous group of villains. Even some pro heroes would have trouble dealing with that much firepower. And, when they actually started shooting everywhere, Mina panicked a lot. She didn't want to implicate so many people because of her hot-headedness, and yet there she was, fighting villains because she couldn't keep her mouth shut. And she was almost shot too. Well, almost. Mina didn't really know how to describe the man that saved her. She knew of his reputation, few people didn't. He was the arch-nemesis of the symbol of peace. Considered the strongest villain in Japan by far. His identity was also unknown to the public. Any reporter that tried to look into it would be silenced by the authorities. So, there he was. The strongest villain in Japan, blocking bullets for her. With his body no less. It gave her a strange feeling that she couldn't really put her hand on. Seeing his hunched back, his moving antennas. It made her feel somewhat safe. He was by no means looking like a hero. But it still gave off that feeling. The only hero that could make people feel like that was All Might. Kirishima however wasn't really feeling the same. He was beyond scared, trembling in place and crying in panic. Beru didn't seem to react to that. So Mina didn't really say anything about it either. Her friend had always been the type to be scared easily. And Beru's image was, by all means, intimidating. Mina could see the previously bold villains shrink as their courage disappeared instantly. No one even dared to shoot towards them anymore. The leader of the group of villains instantly tried pacifying the insectoid. But he didn't even get a few words out before Beru had knocked most of his group into the ground. It was like that, that Mina understood how powerful heroes and villains could actually become. It gave her a bit of perspective. She wanted to become a hero, and this was a good wake-up call for her. She had no time to waste if she wanted to become a good hero. She needed to start training as soon as possible. Kirishima was having similar thoughts. But he was also feeling ashamed at how weak he was. It was a nagging feeling that he's been having for a very long time. The feeling that he was wasting his time away and not striving for anything. He wanted to become a hero, yet he was not working towards improving himself at all. That wouldn't cut it. His fight with this villain group had shown him that he needed to change if he was to become a hero. Beru's actions and strength had motivated the two to become better heroes in the future. But only Mina saw him as a strange hero more than a villain. Kirishima, on the other hand, silently vowed to be the one to capture Beru one day. Making Beru his goal and using it as a motivator to train. And Beru himself was obviously oblivious to anything of the sort. The police were a bit surprised to see him there. But they also didn't have any time to capture him, they knew better than to even waste time trying. They had injured to take care of. They were in a silent understanding to just ignore the insectoid villain as he left through the hole in the roof that he had created. The media also ate up the story. This time, painting him as the villain wasn't really possible. Therefore, most publications were forced to take a neutral stance. Merely calling the confrontation a fight between villains. The injured civilians were also pinned on the group of villains. Mina and Kirishima only had to pay a fine for public work usage, as the police also didn't want to incriminate them for something like this. The people that were injured were quite glad to see the entire group of attackers behind bars. Beru had not killed a single one of them after all. POV Beru another boring month passes by. It seems Shigaraki doesn't have any more ideas for missions to send me on. All for one has also been silent lately. I've been spending my time combining quirks and training to be proficient with them. It's a bit annoying to have countless abilities and zero mastery over any of them. Well, basic mastery, but still, sure, the muscle strengthening ones and enhancers didn't really need training, I already know how to fight using my body. But things like the tails, the fire I took from that hero, even air cannon, all need to be trained a bit. I am only using them in a basic manner. Sure, they may still be strong, but that's just because I have a lot of enhancing quirks. 
Overall, I've been doing my best to master quirks. Then combining them properly. Taking things step by step and exploring the large number of quirks that Kaiadai and all for one stuffed into me. I've also changed the forest in which I train. Because I really don't want to play babysitter while trying to control a forest fire. Oh yeah, I did almost cause a massive forest fire by mistake using that hero's quirk. Actually training some quirks is harder when they are stronger than they should be, I thankfully also took that water hero guy's quirk. I mean, I had the chance, and I didn't see any reason not to. Anyway, instead of a forest fire, I flooded the forest. That's such a great trade-off. I really should be careful with all of these. But then again, I did try to train an extremely volatile fire quirk in the middle of a forest. So I don't really trust myself to be careful. That's why I started training more area of effect quirks above the clouds. I doubt I'll have much to do for now besides training. I've been trying to watch TV, but Kurajiri is really mean about it and always stays on that shitty drama. Stop liking it after missing an episode, other than that, I think I could try and go for a drink with that water hero, maybe I'll do that after training tomorrow POV bearer now, I have run into a hurdle already. I plan to go drinking with that water dude hero. Well, I guess that's both the plan and the goal. Whatever, this first hurdle would be how exactly do I even contact him. I don't know where he lives. Now, I realize that this is like tripping over my own feet at the start of the race. But it's not like I'm used to inviting people for drinks. Vlad was usually the initiator in those exchanges wait. I think there was that group of heroes that were taking care of their kid. Maybe they know where I can find him. Problem is where do I find them? I don't want to just fly over the entire forest all day and hope to find them. But that's exactly what I ended up doing. I did eventually find a few buildings in the middle of a clearing in the forest. It was easy to see, but I didn't really look in that side of the forest a lot. Anyway, I found them, doesn't matter anymore. I landed near the front door of the building and surprisingly they weren't actually there. I guess they just happened to take the little one for a small trip to the woods? Well, regardless, I am now a bit confused I guess I will wait around here for a few days. It's summer anyway, I don't have anything better to do. So, I kept coming back to that place for about a week. Then I decided to spend a night there. Cause nobody cares what I do with my free time anyway, I didn't really get specific instructions, I can just pretend I was training the entire night or something. Not that they'll ask me or anything. So, I may or may not have broken into one of the apartments there and just fell asleep. I didn't expect to wake up to an entire group of kids. Well, I guess they are all my age C U R R E N T L Y like 16. Well, they aren't alone, a few adults are with them. By their clothes, I can tell they're heroes. The kids are a bit out of place though t teacher. A stranger's here what? That's the reaction I get? What happened to my fame? That's strange, this place was supposed to be empty oh. One in the group of cat people finally noticed me. She's the cousin of that brat. I just waved at her, she seemed to rub her forehead for a few seconds. I could see the teachers tense up. Wait, is this one of those hero schools I've heard so much about? It seems like it, teens studying to save people under other heroes. My wave seemed to confuse said, teachers. I don't really recognize any of them, but there's only two of them, and I am really not that great at remembering names. One lady in skin tight clothes and bondage GEAR nice, and a guy with the head of a killer WHALE dope. AR villains attacking us? Bondage woman asked she seemed confused as she held her whip with both hands. Um, he doesn't look that aggressive why are they just speaking to each other? Oi, don't pretend I'm not here. Notice me. Oh, sorry about that. We're just wondering if this is a villain attack or not, the orca guy rubbed his head a bit. Nah I'm in my free time no villain business, I said reassuringly. This may not have sounded as peaceful as I wanted it to, it kinda implies that I would attack them otherwise. I see why are you in our secret training location. This time, one of the cat people spoke up. She's the blonde one, I think she's the one that controlled the earth. Can be sure, the students just watched with intrigue. I guess they were expecting some action or something? Oh I train near here usually but I was looking for you weird cat people, I could hear a few snickers at the mention of cat people. The blonde woman also seemed a bit annoyed. Well hello? What did you want with us? Asked Koda's cousin. Where do I find Koda's parents? Water hero dude that I saved? Now that I think about it, if I just flew around the province for a bit, I would have found him faster. But I was just lazy. Why do you you know what? You do you. Kids. Everyone go take your stuff to your rooms. Shouted bondage woman. The students listened to her, a few of them were still giving me wary looks, but the teachers were just ushering them to move on. That's odd, I was expecting them to at least try and fight me, you know, since they're heroes and all that. Unless they were specifically told not to fight me did that all might dude have something to do with this? Maybe, I don't know. Well, I'll tell you. But you better stop calling us weird cat people. 
said Koda's cousin. She then introduced everyone to me. She told me both their hero names and actual names. But I'll just use the hero ones. Mandalay is the cousin, Pixie Bob is the blonde earthbender, Ragdoll is the green-haired gal that seems overly excited all the time, and Tiger is the crossdressing burly dude. I'm very nice to meet you all, it's only polite that they also get to know my name. They looked at each other a few times. I guess they're contemplating what to do in this situation. Eventually, one of them decided to answer my Q-U-E-S-T-I-O-N finally. I guess you're looking for uncle now, but I still need to know why you are looking for him. I don't want to just give up his location all willy-nilly. Mandalay spoke up. Now, she calls that guy uncle, but he's only like 10 years older than her. And, fair enough, she would want to know my reasons. I want to drink with him no reason to lie about this. It's not like I'm doing a crime. Well, I guess I'm still underage, but they don't know that. They looked at me for a bit. Tiger just widened his eyes and blinked a bit. Is it really that unusual? Or is drinking not acceptable in Japan? I mean, I think it is, they even have alcohol produced in the country. It must be um, sure? I guess. He lives in Musatafu, at this address. Say hi to little Koda for us. Mandalay just said with an empty face. Why do I feel like they're judging my drinking habits? Well, whatever. Thanks good luck with the training. I said as I flew off. They just waved goodbye at me. Finally, time to meet that dude again. POV narration, can someone explain to me what just happened? The blonde pixie Bob asked, still flabbergasted at the odd encounter with Japan's most infamous villain. That title itself now seemed more like a joke than anything. I think I don't want to think about it too much said Tiger, as he slapped his face with both hands. I mean. He seems like a fun person. Said Ragdoll, she seemed to find amusement in the situation. I guess he is we already know he's not dangerous though. At least not Dakota's family and us, Mandalay said as she thought about the situation a bit. The wild wild pussycats were not the only ones confused by the situation. Both Gang Orca and Midnight didn't really know what to make of Beru's appearance. They already knew about him and his identity from Nezu, they were advised not to engage when meeting him. Same for every hero in UA. They all knew of this student-aged powerful villain. Now they found out that he was also a weirdo. But Midnight knew something now, Beru was by no means a danger to society. The guy seemed far too uninterested in fighting them. Even when they all prepared for combat, he just stood there and stared at them, like the situation had nothing to do with him. The two teachers obviously asked the wild wild pussycats about what Beru wanted. And they were told about their previous encounter too. Thinking about that made Midnight smirk a bit. Although she was not one to advocate for underage drinking, she found the idea of an infamous villain, befriending a group of heroes to be quite interesting. It was clear enough that Beru didn't really care about those titles though. He just seemed to be living his life. Still, the teachers were worried about what he was planning. Nezu had said that the plan might be entirely related to his abductors, and that it may not affect anyone else. Either that or he planned on taking revenge on society itself. From these short encounters and his actions in the past, Midnight and Orca could easily deduce that Beru had nothing against heroes in their society. And Nezu would obviously find out about this too. Not like they would keep it a secret. POV Beru I instantly made my way towards the address Mandalay gave me. Honestly, even if she lied to me I'm just glad to be out of that awkward situation. Really, how am I supposed to act when I'm surrounded by kids and heroes? It's also a bit odd how quick they were to just write this off as a normal event. Oh whatever, it's not the strangest thing to happen in the last few years. I've been through a lot of shit in this second life. I can't wait to be done with all of this crime shit, so that I won't need to worry about being awkward around law enforcement. Well, I am technically still at the front door of a hero couple. So I guess I'm not exactly that bothered about it. I just feel a bit strange because everyone is always ogling me like I'm a time bomb. This was usually the look that lackeys gave me in the gang. And it feels a bit sad because I want to leave that life far behind me. But I guess it's hard to forget about it now that I'm technically back in it. At least I am not really considered scum by the COPS heroes, the ones at the camp seemed rather friendly even. I mean, I would have been all over that bondage lady if we weren't surrounded by kids. And then there's the orca head dude, he looked really cool. Now that I think about it. I don't think many people would consider mutations COOL besides teenagers, but they don't count. I guess I am a bit immature, but then again, so is every man-child in existence. I prefer not to act all uptight and self-important all the time. Being carefree is nice, and I can also be carefree while killing all for one later. Ah, such a nice life. I'm still debating the most painful method to kill him. I have a decent grasp of his abilities, and he does have a good healing quirk. So I guess I will need to cut him up a lot and watch him squirm? Well, I'll just think of the details when I get to that point. 
I still want to see what his plans with Shigaraki actually are. You know, so I can tear them down effectively in front of his eyes. Time for a little home visit. Mandalay called the water hero dude uncle now, so I guess his name is now Izumi I knocked a bit on the door. I am invisible right now, if a passing civilian saw me and called the cops things would get a bit annoying. The door opened, Koda looked around the outside a bit confused. Until I appeared in front of him and said. It's not safe for a child to open the door to strangers. He jumped back with a frightened face. But then calmed down after seeing it was me. He actually even smiled. Mister. You scared me. That's mean. Oh gee, I didn't know he had an attitude. Shut up you brat. Call me Baru, mister makes me feel old. I said as I rubbed his head with the palm of my hand and stepped into the house. Where's your mom and dad at? I wanna speak to them I said as I rubbed my antennas. It kinda looked like I was trying to arrange my hair. Not that I have any, mom and dad aren't home right now. They said they'd be back quickly though. You can wait a bit with me. Kota said as he ran and did a flip onto the couch. Well, it looked more like he was jumping a fence due to his size, yay Mandalay, and her friends said hi. I said as Kota perked up again from his couch. Oh. Did you meet cousin Shino and her friends, that great? They're always busy when I ask them to play with me great, I guess I'll spend a few hours listening to this kid speak out about his life. Not like I have anything better to do. I just hope his parents didn't both go out to buy milk and a pack of cigarettes. I mean, I guess it would be a bit unusual for both of them to do it at the same time. Koda was watching some cartoons, I wasn't going to just stand there awkwardly though. I stepped over the couch and sat down. Koda didn't react, he was quite transfixed on his television. Now that I think about it why exactly did they let him home alone? It's probably some hero business or something. I mean, I doubt they would leave him alone for that long. So I guess it's fine, I don't have to also start reprimanding them about childcare, I am really keen on not seeing children be mistreated. It's probably a product of my troubled upbringing. I remember one time a guy tried to rape a little girl in an alleyway. He was technically a higher ranking member of an allied gang. Their boss was friends with Vlad or something. Well, I made sure to bash his head in. It may have started a gang war, but Vlad made it a point to only send me out on the turf wars that ensued, and I basically took care of it all. He said that I should clean up my own mess. He didn't even blame me for it. He said it was just principle. But I think he was planning on taking them over anyway. I mean, he even had man force prepared to take over all of their establishments and territories. He always made sure the bodies were cleaned up in my wake too. Hmm, all that thinking made me hungry. I just kinda walked into the kitchen and grabbed an apple. I don't want to just raid the kitchen of this random guy. Grabbing an apple is already a bit much. Koda didn't seem to mind though. He was still transfixed on his television. Were kids these days really this into cable television? I always thought everything is on the phone nowadays is Koda a boomer? No, that can't be right. I think most people watch television because of this strange hero idolization. Heroes are everywhere in the media now. And their fans would obviously watch them anywhere they could. I munched on my apple as I thought about more uninteresting things. I obviously ate the entire thing, including the core. Cause I'm an animal, then I went and grabbed another one. Can't really blame it on me if they leave them out in the open like that. When I sat back down and took a bite out of the apple, I heard the door swing open. I guess the parents are at home. Either that or a home invader, like I'm not one, that I need to cut up a bit. Koda also rose from his place on the couch. Mom. Dad. We have a visitor. He said excitedly. Koda. Why did you not lock the door? Geez, I hope this kid realizes how dangerous this is. Even his mom is shouting at him. I decided to also walk in the hallway for a bit. And who would even visit us at this time? Then she saw me. Um hello? Yeah, that's about the reactions I expected good day. I'm Baru by the way I just waved at her a bit. Feels a bit awkward, but I'm sure water dude can clear up the air. Now, Koda's father also entered the house, carrying a few bags. He spotted me he stood still for a moment shock was evident on his face. Then he smiled and greeted me warmly. It's great to see you again. I didn't get to thank you properly back then. He even shook my hand. Really polite and all. Yay sorry for coming on Nanans didn't know where to find you, he doesn't seem to be all that mad. I mean, I wasn't really expecting to just find you inside though he said as he rubbed the back of his head. What did you expect? I'm a villain. Although most other villains would seem to disagree, I let him and dad. He's a friend. Koda is really defending me right now huh? It doesn't help that I'm munching on an apple as we speak. The woman of the house finally intervened. Koda. What did we tell you about answering the door when we're not home? Yep, she's mad. I'm not going to defend you brat, don't give me those eyes. I know. Big bro Baru also told me about it, he looked down all guilty after seeing that I wasn't defending him. 
I mean, it's something he should learn. And being called big bro makes me feel much younger. Well Baru, would you tell me why you've come here? I'm sure you have your reasons he seemed to turn a bit serious. His wife took Koda to the living room, likely in an attempt to distract him or something. What are they expecting here? A confession or something? Just thought I'd drop by for a drink the atmosphere was instantly broken, the man stared at me like a scarecrow. I could hear the woman choke in the living room. Again, this reaction bothers me. Is day drinking unacceptable in Japan? I voiced a genuine concern in the form of a question. He compassed himself by coughing a bit in his hand. And no, but it was a bit unexpected also, aren't you a bit young? Oh, so he knows my identity. I guess it's not that hard to find out, my case was pretty famous when I was younger, and my appearance didn't change all that much, only my size. Um I'm a villain? I can drink underage. I really don't know how to respond to that. He also seemed to have difficulty responding to my statement. Um, I can't really condone underage drinking how about some tea? You know what, that's good enough. Not like I can get drunk anyway. I just nodded and we both walked to the kitchen. His wife and Koda soon joined us, and we just talked about random stuff, like dramas and cartoons. I also told them a few stories about my delivery missions. I obviously let out any unfriendly details, wouldn't want Koda to hear about anything too graphic. We did that for a few hours. I also learned that Koda's mom is named Riaiko. My time there was quite relaxing. We also talked a bit about the muscular incident, and how thankful both of them were for me saving them. Koda was also happy to see us all get along. I left after a while though, didn't really want to overstay my welcome. Now said I could drop by anytime I want though. Which is nice. POV narration a year quickly passed by, with Beru's visits to now Izumi becoming more and more frequent. The insectoid was spending most of his time off with the family. Now had also come into contact with the principal of UA, who provided him with more information on Beru. And, in turn, now also told him more about his encounters with the villain. Now didn't really know what to make of his friend, one word to describe him would be eccentric, but he also seemed quite caring and good-natured. He found it hard to believe that such a person could harm anyone. And yet, Beru was shown to be one of the deadliest villains. Even recently, he was spotted hunting down a group of villains. None of which survived. They were all cut to pieces, some were crushed to death. The only reason now didn't talk to Beru about it was since he always made sure to not harm any civilian or bystander. He knew Beru had his reasons, and he didn't feel like prying into them too much. He had no way of knowing that Beru didn't really consider his actions wrong. He saw those villains the same way he saw rival gangs back in his gangster days. Simple-minded fools that chose a life of crime thinking it would make living easier. He considered everyone that chose such life to be automatically prepared to die. As that was the ideology that he had instilled into himself from a young age. It was how he justified his killings at an early stage. Before he stopped caring completely. For now, Beru was a strange teenager. Talking to him felt more like talking to a childish adult. It was evident that he knew his way through life, but he also didn't stress himself with anything, he didn't bother with responsibility, and he didn't take many things seriously. Now could only assume that was because of his lack of upbringing. He had matured faster, but not as conventionally as others. A lot of the serious issues that others had simply flew over his head. He was mature as he understood how his choices affected others, he understood the consequences and weight of his own actions. Now had managed to have a serious talk with Beru at some point. They talked about what he would do after he finished his revenge. To which the insectoid responded. I'll likely talk with the authorities I will decide when the time comes. It was clear that he was aware of his crimes. He knew that living a normal life would be difficult after he was done. But he also seemed to be happy knowing that. Nezu also didn't like the situation all that much. If not for the knowledge that All Might himself had no confidence in defeating Beru, he would have tried to capture him at some point. But All Might was also busy training his successor. The child that was to join Yue as well in the upcoming entrance exams. Tashinori Yagi may have tried to hide that from his boss, but he was easily seen through. Therefore, Nezu knew that the chances of them winning was even smaller with All Might transferring one for all. So, the situation was going to end in Beru getting his revenge. At least Nezu now had assurance that his revenge wouldn't harm any innocent lives. He didn't care as much for the villains, he was smart enough to understand how little villains contributed to society, the rat bear dog, didn't see their deaths as important. Although, some people still acted as their lives mattered. Nezu understood that some of them could change, but he also knew that many of them were way past the point of no return. He, and most of the heroes that were informed in this issue, knew that there were almost no chances for reform for villains. The prison system was just a way to keep them locked down, not to rehabilitate them like it was written on paper. So, for now, Nezu waited to see if he could help the mutated teen when the time was right. 
POV Baruha, an entire year has passed by. If not for now, Ryaiko and Koda I would have died of boredom. Well, I didn't grow all that much. I think I stopped at around 2 meters 6.5 legs feet whatever tall. But I do have a constant hunchback, so I guess I am a bit taller than that. Not much has happened in the last year. Well, I guess Shigaraki has started sending me on less moronic missions. But my bar is really low with him. He's also gotten quieter, god bless, he seems to be cooking up something. Well, both him and all for one. But the guy still doesn't show his face. At least I learned what Shigaraki's supposed to be. He's supposedly all for one's successor. I guess all for one also has low standards. Regardless, I doubt he genuinely cares for Shigaraki. But killing him would likely mess up some of all for one's plans. But this brat isn't as important as the person I plan on killing soon. I realize that Kaidai is vital to all for one's plans too. I'd even say that he's a lot more important. He's been making these biological weapons for a while now. I am one of THEM I guess, but the rest are a lot weaker. And they also don't have much intelligence. Which is quite strange to see, they were all humans formerly. Well, there are very few exceptions, but they are mostly brain dead. I know that some of these biological weapons are the kids I failed to protect. So it obviously falls on me to put them out of their misery. I will do it when the time is right though. I can wait a few weeks more before taking out Kayadai. That madman has his days numbered anyway. I've trained a lot in the past few years. I mastered most of my quirks already, well, at least the ones I like and use. The rest are kinda just there. Now, I guess I'll go take a piss or something I mean, I do drink a lot. I kinda gave up on alcohol and just moved to sodas and other stuff. And yes. I have a penis too, I can just hide it inside my body though. It's a bit weird. But I got used to it. Oh yeah, I can now also pretend to have more sentience. All for one already considers me as intelligent as Kurajiri. Although I only communicate with short phrases and words. It's still enough for me to annoy Shigaraki from time to time. He always cries to his daddy though. Although all for one doesn't take it that seriously. He just considers me talking back to Shigaraki to be amusing. He thinks that my loyalty lies with HIM Kinda like Machia, so he's not really worried at all. Well things are about to get a bit less cordial between us soon. POV bear well, I think I managed to find out what Shigaraki and all for one are cooking up. It seems the baby delinquent Shigaraki has had it with the heroes and has decided to attack the symbol of peace. Something about him growing weaker. It also seems like All Might has started teaching a newer generation of heroes. Which sounds quite nice. Now, Shigaraki has started gathering a large group of dangerous villains. It's quite strange that they seem so confident about attacking a group of high schoolers, but I guess they don't really have the brains to realize how stupid this sounds. Why exactly does the attack need to happen in a high school filled with heroes? Even if the site of the attack is a dozen or so kilometers away from the actual school building, it just seems like an idiotic move. If I wanted to execute someone like him I'd choose something more practical. Like a public hostage situation with civilians. Followed by an ambush. But then again, I am not really the leader of the operation. Still, now that both All for One and Shigaraki are distracted, I can go and take out Kayadai and every Nomu inside his shitty laboratory. The only one that can actually pose a threat to me might be Gigantamachia. But he's a bit dull. And I am also a lot faster than him, so I'm not really worried. His regeneration doesn't really work well with beheadings. I will attack Kayadai an hour before I need to attend the attack on this UA school. It's still strange to me that adults are finding attacking teenagers a worthwhile way to spend their time. I mean, most of them are gathered to take care of the students. They are mostly cannon fire, with a few PPL that have decent quirks. Shigaraki and All for One decided to use Inomu to take down All Might. It's supposed to be on the same level of strength as me. And the two of us together should be able to take down the symbol. Kurajiri will also provide support. Now, this Nomu is somewhat familiar to me a bulky body, exposed brain and a bird beak, this is obviously little Sauma or what remains of him. I remember the Mad Doctor and All for One talking about the kids at some point in my incarceration. Apparently, only three of them survived the experiments and were turned into Nomus. Sauma being the strongest one. They referred to him as the brat with the regeneration quirk. Which is how I even realized they were talking about him in the first place. He should also be a teenager now, but he's been turned into whatever this abomination is. I will make sure to put him out of his misery. I can't do much else to help him the way he is now. And I don't want him to be kept in a laboratory for the rest of his existence. I doubt anyone can help him recover. Well maybe I should still give it a chance. Just trap the Nomus in the lab and capture Sama. Yeah, I think doing that would be a bit better. I mean, if Kaidai can do something like that, there must be someone out there that can undo it. The world is vast. 
And if there are a lot of gnomas the government won't experiment on all of them. Regardless, the attack on the high school will be in a few days. I need to prepare a bit for it. Well, I don't have a lot of preparation left to do, it's all I've been doing for the last few years. I can barely wait. I will take out all for one's most useful and loyal subordinates in one fell swoop. Then I will attend this raid before they notice anything is wrong. And kill his beloved disciple. Killing Shigaraki is also something I've been wanting to do for a while now. His arrogance is annoying, but it's also got a weird feeling to it. It's almost like I'm dealing with a child throwing tantrums than a villain. I don't really know what to think about him. It's pretty clear that he's been groomed by all for one too, so he's nothing more than a pawn. I somehow can't bring myself to actually be mad at him. But I still need to kill him to fuck up all for one's plans well, I still have more time to think about it. He's pretty harmless all things considered. Well, minus all of the murderous tendencies he has. He keeps trying to send me after people that cuss at him O-N-L-I-N-E he graduated from playing with bots at some point. I obviously don't take his request seriously. But he's quite chill when he's not throwing a tantrum. I would also like to warn that all might dude about this assault, but then he might do something unexpected, and I won't be able to properly fight all for one. Beru. Can you go and check on Jiren? He's the one handling the recruiting that I told you about. After I've also learned to speak he started calling me by my name. He's also been a bit more careful with his requests. Although most of them still have that tone of superiority. Sure, I said in a distorted voice. It's nice to see how unnerved people are by it. But I don't really use it when speaking to FRIENDS like now and his folks. But it does provoke fear in most listeners. Well, it depends on the situation too, but it's fun anyway. I left towards Jiren's hideout. He's some information broker in the underworld of Hosu City. He's the one tasked with spreading the news about this attack and recruiting members. He already had over 100 villains when I last checked. This recruitment drive is pretty impressive, but not as much when you realize that they are just two bit thieves and useless murderers. They will have to do though, although, I have my doubts these guys are even capable of killing those middle schoolers I saved at the mall, that one time oh well, the assault on UA is bound to fail. My plan is centered around the failure of everything all for one has his hands in. I dropped by the alleyway where Jiren has his office a broken down barbershop repurposed into a bar. Not really fancy, but it's not that bad. I've been to worse pubs before. Hello. I said as I opened the door and the bell above it ringed a bit. The bar was mostly empty. Only one or two people inside. And all of them are criminals. They are either here to act mysterious or ask Jiren about a job. I mean, that's usually the case with small-time criminals that think killing and stealing makes them cooler. Oh did Shigaraki send you to get the details on the recruitment? Jiren asked from behind the bar. I guess he wants to get straight to the point. Indeed then I looked at the other stooges inside the bar. They all looked away from me. I guess I do have a bit of a reputation for hunting down people. Usually, criminals would try to intimidate you to feel better about their sorry lives, it hasn't worked with me in my past life, and it won't work now. Well, it especially won't work now, since most of them know and fear me. Don't worry. They are also getting recruited for the mission. Great, more cannon fodder. I mean, I will likely have to be the one to clean them up. And I can't really dismember them in front of children, so I will have to break their bones instead. So difficult oh lord, the participants are all mostly listed on this file. Well, at least the villain names they used when registering. They will all come to the warehouse at the agreed upon time. Heh, this guy is pretty thorough. The information dealers I dealt with in the past were mostly hookers and drug addicts. They weren't reliable, but you would be hard pressed to find anything else at an affordable rate. I took the file from him and nodded. Then I sat down on one of the stools. Whiskey on the rocks I mean, might as well. It's been a while since I've had any. And Jiren does also sell drinks. It's also not the first time I drink from him, so it's not that big a surprise for him. And he also poured it in a large pint, just the way I like it. An actual whiskey glass is a bit too small for me to even get the taste in my mouth. Thanks. He seems to like a polite customer. I guess most of the responses he gets usually are grunts and whatnot. Like I said, people, trying to act mysterious. As I was sipping on my pint of whiskey, one large BLOKE drinking from a pint makes me feel British, decided to come to me. Ha. Huh. Why is a kid drinking with adults? Great, a dipshit. You think people wouldn't realize your identity? You fucking bug child. Now, now. He's getting the attention of the rest of the bar for no reason. You think the authorities hiding your identity would stop people from noticing, huh? He looked around at the small crowd of villains that were looking curiously at the situation. Jiren was about to drag this dude out the back, but I raised my hand to stop him. He was so caught up in his speech that he didn't even notice it. Listen to this guys. 
The symbol of evil is a fucking 17 year old bra, he didn't even get to finish his sentence when I swiped my arm lazily at him. I severed his neck with one finger as his blood started spurting out instantly. Now, it's not that he made me mad or anything. But the best way to approach situations like this is to be decisive. Sorry for the mees gyre and just shrugged as the idiot slumped to the floor, still holding his neck in shock. I don't get what he was trying to achieve. But I guess he was one of those attack the strongest looking guy type. They are idiots most of the time. I downed the rest of my drink and stood up. Jiren had already told two of his associates to start disposing of the body. The rest of the bar was quiet, everyone was once again staring at their drinks and doing their best to avoid eye contact with me. I just left after saying my goodbyes to Jiren and giving him a gold necklace from my collection. I don't really have any cash, but he takes those in exchange for a few drinks. So the next few times I drop by I won't have to pay anything. I walked out of the building and was about to spread my wings. Something strange caught my attention though. I was followed out of the bar. Now, this is a bit interesting. I didn't even realize a blonde girl was inside the bar in the first place. POV narration Himiko Toga was not having the best of times. She had just started her career as a villain, and she wanted to see what she could do around Hosu City. She had heard something about some mass recruitment and decided to check it out. But it turned out to be quite boring for her. It was some plan to kill the symbol of peace, and she really didn't care enough about that to join up. She was about to leave when someone that she found intriguing entered the bar. The tall insectoid that was also known as the symbol of evil the only known villain to have fought the symbol of peace to a standstill. Now, Toga wasn't a type to care much for titles and other things. But she found his appearance exotic. She suddenly got an urge to see how his blood looked like. It wasn't something she could help, it was the nature of her quirk. She was quite excited when that villain had started riling up the insectoid. She was hoping that maybe Beru would get injured. But something else happened instead. She couldn't even see it properly, but the man's neck was cut open. She knew Beru did it, she could see the blood on his finger. More and more blood spurted out of the man's neck. Beru didn't even spare him another glance. Even when some blood got into his drink, he just kept gulping it down. Not even looking at the corpse of his previous attacker. Himiko found that scene extremely exciting. She was hoping for some blood to get spilt. And she had gotten her wish, the floor was soaked in blood. Just not Beerus blood. She also found Beru interesting, she started seeing him as someone like her. Someone she could befriend, someone that would accept her for who she truly was. She decided to follow him out and see if she could stir up the courage to talk to him. But him suddenly spreading his wings startled her, as she hid behind the nearest object she could find. She was trying her best to hide. Even though she actually wanted to speak to him. Her fear kept her from approaching the insectoid. She wasn't afraid of Beru, she was afraid of being rejected. POV Beru this girl is pretty good at hiding her presence not gonna lie. I almost didn't notice her at all. Well, almost, I can still notice it. I can literally hear her heartbeat from behind that dumpster. Well, it's more like a trash can than a dumpster. I can see some of her hair as it is just wiggling around in the air. She didn't choose a great hiding spot, you can come out now, I just stared at the hair, the girl rose from behind that trash can, and looked at me with a strange smile. What's her deal? This isn't exactly a great ambush if that's what she was going for. Well, she's blonde, wearing her hair in two buns. She's also in a high school uniform. I don't recognize her at all. But she looks kinda cute. But she also looks completely crazy. Just my luck, hello. I am Himiko Toga, a pleasure to meet you sir. I mean, that's great and all. But what's your deal? Hello, I am Beru I mean, I will respond to her greeting. The only reason I'm not leaving right now is that I have a lot of free time after this hey, so I just wanted to see if we could become friends. Toga just spurted out frantically. What? I just told her my name. Does she already want to be friends? What does she want out of me? Paranoia lenses on, um why? I barely even know you. You look young, and you are plenty cute, go spend time with your friends or something. I stopped making my voice distorted for a while. I'm also kinda curious about her now. It's not like I get to talk to all that many people usually. Shigaraki and his folk don't count, my high skill in social interactions, conveyed my message clearly. The message was leave me alone I don't care they didn't btw, why is she turning red though? Why you think I'm cute? I I wasn't expecting our relationship to develop so quickly, now hold the fucking phone. What? This is what she took from my roundabout way of telling her to fuck off? She just singled out the compliment and ignored any other word. She doesn't even look like she heard the rest of the sentence. How old are you again? I am a bit concerned about how simple she is. She might get taken advantage of or something. Oh. I am 16, perfectly grown up. No, you aren't, you're a teenager. 
I barely even consider myself a grown-up, and I'm like in my THIRTIES didn't keep track, if I put both my lives together. I mean, you are young. You shouldn't be spending your time in shitty alleyways and villain hideouts, I will try to persuade her to leave me alone after building some trust. Maybe I can also tell her not to get into this kind of life without any good reason. It's not like she can get anything good out of it. Women usually have a trough in the underworld although, her smile got really wide when she heard my question. I'm glad that you care I don't, but go on. But at least I can be myself in this place. I don't need to worry about what others think of me. Well. That's not exactly odd to hear from a 16 year old. I looked at her a bit, she squirmed in place for a while. She clearly has something on her mind. Not gonna lie, her mannerisms are quite cute. What is it? Speak out my words immediately made her talk. Sir can you please give me some of your blood? There it is. My hot the crazy scale was warning me of this. I it's not that I want to hurt you but, my quirk makes me want this hmm? Well, that's a better reason than what the other crazies I've dated had. I guess. But I won't give you much. She looks a bit desperate, which makes me pity her. And any open wound would close up in seconds for me, so this isn't that big a deal at all. It's kinda like bending down and helping someone pick something up. Ah oh, really. Thank you. She jumped and hugged me. Geez, she can jump quite high. I wasn't expecting that. Well, I saw it coming, but still. Then, I felt a knife trying to dig into my back. Well, she couldn't really scratch it at all. But she tried. You won't get far like that she looked a bit surprised, but I think it's more that I didn't react violently to her attack. I mean, I did say I'd give her some blood, she likely just took that as an invitation or something. She broke the hug and looked up at me. I just cut open my palm with my claw and let some of my blood flow in front of her. She quickly opened her mouth and brought it close to my slowly regenerating wound. I slowed it down on purpose, I mainly wanted to see her reaction. Didn't think it would be this major. Drinking blood is not that big a deal. At least she's all that weird. I've seen much worse. She opened her eyes while licking my palm. It looked like she had stars in them or something. Eventually, the cut closed up. She was still licking my palm though, I ended up having to stop her by pulling it away. I mean, no reason to get weird about it, she's a bit too young for me. I'd say she should come back when she's a bit older or something. Thank you. Um, can I please come with you? I, I put my hand up, stopping her from speaking more. Nah, I don't really have my own home. And I really don't feel like looking after you all the time. Oh, by the way, don't join the mission Jiren is recruiting for, it won't go well, I said as I spread my wings again. Till next time. I flew off, not giving her a chance to say anything else. She still had time to smile brightly and wave at me. Really, what an odd encounter. I didn't expect something like this to come out of a shitty walk to a bar. I think I'll just sleep a lot to pass the time or something. POV bearer the day has finally come. The assault on the high school is going to happen in a few hours. I have just enough time to go deal with the doctor and Gigantamachia. Kurajiri and Shigaraki are still getting prepared for the raid. I can just leave them to get to it, as they don't really need me to be here for now. I just need to be there when the attack starts. I do want to see if they truly want to kill kids for whatever reason. I mean, they may be villains, but they should have some code of conduct. At least my gang had some strict rules against harming children. I remember having to get rid of a few members for doing that type of thing. They usually got the same treatment as the snitches. Although it was always annoying having to buy more buckets. But I guess we weren't really two bit thugs. So I shouldn't expect them to have a code of conduct at all. Well, I'll take care of it when I get to it. No reason to worry too much about it, they are all weaklings anyway I mean, what's the use of superpowers if you can't even use them properly? I'm pretty sure I could have taken care of them in my past life. They are pretty much useless. Beru? Can you go and check on the warehouse? Great, there's my exit ticket. I kinda expected Shigaraki to ask me to do something like this. Although my presence isn't needed here if I just disappeared it would be a bit suspicious. But, now I have an hour to go deal with Kaidai and his lab. I just nodded and flew away out an open window, of course, doors are outdated. I quickly flew above the clouds and sped towards Kaidai's laboratory, pipes coming out of my back and speeding me up further. I reached the hospital in the middle of that stupid forest quite quickly. The actual laboratory is underground. I don't really like this place, but I guess I can't do much about it. I'm basically going in to ruin it anyway. I just entered the front door and went towards the basement. I already know the route. And, like always, it was filled with all sorts of gnomus. They obviously didn't attack me, they know me. They are just told to patrol the area and make sure no one suspicious comes in. If I kill Kaidai most of them will turn idle. As they take their orders from him. All for one is more of the man behind the SCENES or the monitor if you want to be specific. He barely does anything himself. 
It's a bit odd, he seemed to be quite the hands-on guy when he came to get me and the other brats. I guess first impressions can be wrong? Well, it doesn't matter, I'm more than ready to fight him. I don't have much to worry about him. I mean, I'll still have to be careful. The dude is strong, but I at least have some confidence in defeating him. I eventually reached Kayadai's laboratory. I obviously took the elevator, as I am a civilized man. He was there, operating on a Nomu or something. He's a short old man, white lab coat, bold, steampunk goggles, bushy mustache. He looked quite surprised to see me. Gigantomachia was just sitting in a corner, I think he's just staring at the walls. He's a bulky dude, body filled with rocky muscles. He has spiky brown hair, a prominent rocky jawline and large canines. Kinda like those of an orc. He may be strong, but he's not all that important. He's quite dull and easy to deal with. He also won't be able to fight all that well without his gigantification quirk. This is quite the enclosed underground space after all. Kaidai is actually the first person I need to take out, all he needs to do is press a button, and every Nomu in the building will rush this place. And I don't want that, oh, Beru. Has Master sent you here to fetch something? Kaidai isn't really suspecting anything. I guess he wouldn't. He probably thinks I'm as simple-minded as Giganto. Yeah, something like that, I don't need to bother too much with him. I don't feel like listening to him talk all that much. I stepped closer to him and looked him in the eye. He just raised an eyebrow, likely finding my approach to be quite strange. POV narration thanks for the quirks, Beru said in a happy childlike tone. He swiped his hand much in the same way he did at the bar. Severing the doctor's neck while keeping eye contact. His clear voice startled the mad doctor, then Kaede's eyes widened as his neck started bleeding. Beru decided to just let him bleed out. A slow death, just so he could watch his master's other faithful servant get cut to pieces. Beru swiped his claws at Kaedai a few times, cutting off his hands and legs to ensure that he couldn't pull off any funny moves. He just stared in shock. All of that had happened in two seconds. Gigantamachia quickly got up from his sitting position. He looked at the Ant-Man warily. He wasn't sure of how to approach Beru. He wasn't all that intelligent, to begin with. And he also wasn't sure why Beru would attack Kaedai. Did their master want him dead? Had his service been unsatisfactory? He didn't expect Beru to rush him too. But he quickly blocked a claw to the side. It was a casual attack from Beru, yet it still almost severed his hand. W why are you attacking me? Have you gone mad? He was growing angrier as his body was being filled with cuts. His hardened muscles were not even remotely helping him. He also couldn't grow in size due to their current location being underground. So, he was stuck with having to tank hits. But, slowly, he was running out of stamina, and his morale was falling greatly. He couldn't feel any pain. But he could feel the numbness spread around his body, as he was quickly losing blood from the many cuts inflicted on him. His arm that had been dangling from a few strips of muscle, had already fallen off. Beru just stared at him as he slowly sunk to the ground. The numbness spreading all over his body. Well, that was quite easy, but I did take them by surprise. Was Beru's thought. But the way he started the attack determined this easy outcome. First, he claimed that he was sent by all for one. Then he murdered the only person in the room that could disprove his lie. It took a while for Giganto to wrap his head around the severity of the situation. He was taken by surprise, and he didn't even have time to react. By the time he started swinging his fist in retaliation, he was already filled with cuts. Beru even allowed Giganto's punches to land, as they didn't even make the insectoid flinch. The fight was one-sided and ended quickly. Beru just left the room with a happy mind. He was now excited to finish off his plans. POV Beru I left the hospital, most of the Nomas were still doing the last tasks they had received. But some of them remained idle. Still, they didn't attack me, they aren't really intelligent enough to realize I had just killed their creator. I think Kayadai was trying to create more intelligent ones. But he probably didn't get to go that far into his research. Oh well, he won't be doing any of that anymore. I honestly thought I'd find Kayadai's death to provide me with more satisfaction. But I just felt he was pathetic in his last moments. Same for Gigantamachia. Neither of them proved to be anything special to me. I guess only all for one himself will provide me with that feeling of satisfaction. Well, his turn will come. Sooner than later. I wonder how long it will take for him to realize that his loyal servants are dead. I hope to be there to watch his reaction POV Beru so, here I am at the warehouse, waiting for Shigaraki, Kurajiri and Nomu Sama to arrive. There are around 160 villains altogether. And, you know, I really got this revelation late in life, but the word villain is used really loosely in this world. I remember villains being a bit more intimidating than street thugs you know? Like them being the enemy of powerful heroes and whatnot. Venom, Green Goblin and others, I guess reality is oftentimes disappointing. But there are two problems on my mind right now. 
How exactly do I bring all for one out of his hiding hole? I mean, I can slaughter all of his ASSOCIATES which I've already started doing, but I haven't seen the man in person in a long time. How exactly should I approach this? I've no doubt he wouldn't come out if I take Shigaraki hostage. I don't think he considers him important enough oh well, I'll think about it when I get to it. Now about my other problem Baru. This is my other problem. This clingy psycho decided to join the raid for some reason. She's currently hugging onto my back like a cola on a tree. She keeps rubbing her cheek on my spine like a maniac. Now, I don't have any confidence issues, but I did look in a mirror recently. What's her deal? Is it because of the blood? It wasn't even that big a deal. I mean, Toga may be cute. But I advised her not to come to this raid. And here she is, doing exactly the opposite. She probably took me telling her not to come here as a sign that I was going to be present. Either that or she asked Jiren about it. Knowing the guy, he'd tell her about it with a smile on his face, didn't I tell you not to come here? I asked once again and promptly got IGNORED obviously. This gal shut herself up in her own world right now. I said it louder this time too, which startled some of the villains nearby. I think they only heard me speak in a distorted tone till now. Well, it seems Toga only halfway ignored my words. She did respond in the end. I knew I'd find you here you did say that we'd meet again right? Wasn't that basically an invitation? For fuck's sake. I guess I should have expected something like this to happen. Her type is usually really unstable, she can read between the lines and understand exactly what she wants to from my words. Baru can you give me more blood? She asked while still clinging to me. I mean, it would be cuter if you wasn't asking for my life juice. Maybe later, after the attack or something. It seems anything besides outright rejection is a positive answer for her. She just started hugging me tighter. Now, I could tell her to fuck off. But she's really quite H-A-R-M-L-E-S-S besides being a bit irritating at times. She seems quite F-R-I-E-N-D-L-Y in her own way, I see no reason to antagonize her for that. Thanks. By the way how do you know this will fail? Seems like a pretty large crowd. It seems she's actually curious about this. I can tell from the tone, her face is still stuck to my back. Numbers don't mean much when they are all cannon fodder. Besides, there's not much here to fight that all might guy. I said in a more quiet tone this time. Only Toga, and maybe a few that have enhanced H-E-A-R-I-N-G if there are any, could hear my words properly. Hmm. But Mr. Jiren said that the League had some type of weapon against All Might. That and you, you're basically what he used to sell this entire operation. She seems a bit more confused by my answer. And her question is also a bit strange to me. Did they use my reputation to attract more people to the raid? That's annoying. Well, I guess it's also flattering in a way. But now I have more villains I need to take out. Hmm, I guess I don't need to do it alone. I grabbed Toga's arm and pulled her in front of me. She let off a small eek, she then looked me in the eyes for a bit, turning more and more red as she did so. I got closer and closer to her, she closed her eyes and waited a bit. Does she really think I'd try to kiss her? I mean, it would be weird to do so without lips. My mouth got close to her ear, and I whispered, at a volume, only she could faintly hear. When I give you the signal, you also start fighting the other villains. Then I pulled back. She looked confused for a bit. But then she nodded, with a resolute look on her face. I don't really have to give her a type of signal, I'll just do something obvious, like screaming now. Or something? Seeing her disappointed face is also fun. Maybe that type of teasing was a bit too much for her? Nah, she'll get over it eventually. Mini ha. I guess she actually got mad. My arm was still wrapped around her t-h-o-u-g-h from when I pulled her, and she was still hugging me. So I guess she's not that mad. Eventually, a portal opened up, Kurajiri finally brought Shigaraki and Nomusama around these parts. Shigaraki's expression was fun to watch when he saw me. He even came over to me for a bit. Well, not much of his expression can be seen through that stupid hand on his face. But his neck scratching stopping was a good enough indicator of surprise. Um. What is are you what? He can't even articulate a proper sentence. Is the sight so surprising for him? Her friend I don't really need to act about it. Afo already considers me as intelligent as Kurajiri, which means I am capable of making some decisions on my own. Kurajiri himself didn't find the situation all that concerning. Now that I think about it. He's likely more confused about how I managed to get a girl to cling to me with my appearance. And to be honest, I don't fucking know. 160 villains already, I gave him the report he had asked me for. Well, it's why he sent me here first, to make sure the numbers are right. Well okay then. It seems everyone's gathered then. He said in an even tone and looked back at the crowd. He started looking around and giving a speech about how this is a mission to break down the feeble society built on the back of the symbol of peace. Toga wasn't even listening to any of it, quite rude of her. 
This man is clearly pouring his heart out in this speech about what was it again. Wasn't listening either, oh whatever, it doesn't matter. Speech done, Kurajiri portal go. Let's get on with this raid. POV bearer we were teleported to a large plaza. Thugs poured out of Kurajiri's portals and covered the entire plaza. It seems we are currently in a dome of sorts. It's certainly well lit, I can't remember anything similar to this back in my world. I would describe this as quite sick. I mean, I was never one for admiring buildings and whatnot. But this looks just that great. It's also quite massive, it looks bigger than most villages Togo was also looking around curiously. She seemed to be expecting something, maybe to jump around and cut up the people around us. But I want to see how exactly Shigi wants to deal with this situation. I can't see any symbol of peace in that crowd in front of us. After a large stone staircase, I can see two heroes and around 20 students. They seem to be cowering in fear, most of them at least. I can also see a familiar face or two. That girl with pink skin and hair and that hard guy with black hair from the mall. I guess he's got red hair right now though. The girl noticed me quite quickly, I guess I do stand out, she suddenly showed a large smile and waved her hand in a salute. Her colleagues were looking at her oddly. It's kinda nice to see that not everyone has an adverse reaction to seeing me. Some of them looked at me in fear after seeing me. I don't even think it's because of my appearance, it should just be due to my title and reputation. I mean, this is a villain attack after all. I don't really recognize any of the teacher's heroes though. There's a guy with B-A-N-D-A-G-E-S around his neck, well it looks more like a scarf. There's also another person wearing an astronaut S-U-I-T quite dope. The students are all dressed in hero costumes as well. I wonder if they will be allowed to fight. This should look like a dire situation for them. TSK, it seems the symbol of peace is late maybe killing a few kids will make him hurry, Shiggy said with a shitty grin on his face. Typical villain talk. Nothing unusual about that. Kurajiri. Split them up. Well, I don't really want that to happen. I guess this is a good point to take this warp gate quirk. I've wanted it for quite a while now. He teleported to them as the hero with the bandage scarf, started fighting the large group of villains. Toga can you go help the yellow goggles one? She just nodded and jumped in the fray, her knife cutting around a lot of the villains. She approached the hero and started cutting down the villains around him. The hero was confused at first, but just went with it, he wasn't exactly in a situation to question any of the help he was receiving. POV narration as Toga went and assisted Shota Azawa, Shigaraki instantly started complaining. What is that idiot doing? Baru keep your dog on a leash. He shouted for Baru to hold Toga back. But, when he looked around, Baru was nowhere in sight. Then he saw a misty body flying from the top of the stairs towards the middle of the villain army. His eyes widened as he saw the bloody figure of Baru, licking his claws as he coldly watched the situation in the plaza from the side of the heroes. W what is this? Why he didn't even know what to make of the situation. And neither did 13, she had been tasked with protecting the students, she was about to be gravely injured by that warp gate villain. Only for all of the portal mist to disperse. It revealed Baru with his hand dug into the metal plate that was protecting Kurajiri's real body. The insectoid then swung his arm around and threw the gravely injured villain back into the crowd with no care in the world. 13 could see the students shivering in fear at the sight. Mina just let off a sigh of relief, however. Everyone, calm down, he's with us. She said with a confident tone. She was smart enough to assess the situation properly. And, had she not calmed everyone down, 13 would have done the same. Sup Beru said in a distorted tone. His voice startled everyone, they didn't think he'd actually speak to them. W what is happening exactly? Asked 13 cautiously. My plan is in motion this is a part of it don't worry, I'll make sure none of you gets involved, Baru said in a much clearer tone to the confused hero. His answer immediately reminded her of the meeting Nezu had held. They were already told that Baru was no danger to them. So she could finally relax. What's this bullshit? A few of the students weren't quite relaxed though. Including the explosive teen, Bakugo. Baru just tilted his head a bit, his antennas flailing around in confusion. It was a strange way of expressing emotion, but a few of the students found it amusing. POV Barry you're a villain. Why are you helping US? I just scratched my head as the student started screaming in front of me. Whatever, I said as I turned around. Not paying the brat any mind and staring at the situation. Toga is a lot more skilled than I gave her credit for. I think she's actually evenly matched with me in my past life. Both in physical power and skill. Well, I guess she excelled in short blades, I much prefer bludgeoning weapons and firearms. So skills are a bit harder to identify. Still, she can take care of these thugs quite easily. The hero is also great, he's better than most of these thugs individually, by a large margin too. But the two of them are slowly getting overwhelmed by the numbers. I guess I should go help them Bakugo no. I heard the female teacher shout. 
Who's Bakugo? Then I heard an explosion hit my back. I didn't actually feel it since I can resist high temperatures and I can absorb the shock from it. But it was still there. I turned around and stared at him. I guess the explosion was quite big, there's a bit of a burned crater in between me and him. Now, he may be a bit annoying, but I ain't no kid M-U-R-D-E-R-E-R -E -E they get a bad rep in prison. I just appeared in front of him and slapped him once. I made sure not to use my claws as to not deal too much damage. The slap sent him to the ground and knocked him out. Good thing I trained my control, otherwise I would have killed this kid by mistake, rude is all I said. The students were not really afraid of me for this one though. Most just sighed and facipumed. I guess this is this guy's usual behavior? So this is the strength of All Might's arch nemesis, I could hear a whisper from a green-haired kid. He seems to be talking to himself mostly though. I then looked down once again. I could see Shigaraki frantically looking for Kurajiri. I don't know if the Kuro is actually dead. Nomus are usually quite resistant. But he's certainly out of this fight. No doubt about that. The Sama Nomu was still standing idly, I guess Shigi forgot to tell it to do something in his panic. Nomu. Kill the heroes. Great, it seems his memory is still working. The Sama Nomu started running towards the Scarf Hero and Toga. His fist was already prepared to strike. By the time the teacher noticed him he was already too close. I guess I have to block that, can't have Sama kill someone like this. I guess I can also use my new quirk when doing so. Black Mist swallowed me as I reappeared in front of Sama, blocking his punch with my chest. I used impact recoil immediately, Sama's arm trembled as his muscles absorbed the impact of his own punch. The hero was shocked to see me suddenly appear in front of him. I'll take care of this one I don't want other idiots injuring Sama. I'd rather do it myself. Well, I guess there's no one here right now that can actually do much to Sama. But hey, at least he gets to fight me. He tried to punch me again, but this time I grabbed both of his fists. Keeping him in place as he struggled to get away from my iron grip. Shigaraki also seems to be approaching the three of us. Namely, Toga. He is sneaking in a group of villains, probably looking to disintegrate her as soon as he found an opening. Too bad she wasn't fighting alone. Even though I'm a bit occupied with Sama, the hero guy is still here. He caught sight of Shigi and wrapped him in bandages immediately, taking him by surprise. He tried to disintegrate them, but it seems he's not really able to. Well, whatever, the hero used him as a bat and took down quite a few villains. I forgot that group fights were this fun. POV Beru Toga was dancing around the scarf dude and cutting up villains left and right. Still, if I don't intervene they will get overwhelmed. Shiggy was thrown away like a rock from a slingshot, his hand costume flying away in every direction. He should still be recovering. And Sama is still struggling to take his hands away from me. But since I'm using a combination of all of my strengthening quirks, my arms grew to be the same size as Salma's, the only difference being that my strength is slightly better. I pulled and raised him over my head. The Nomu didn't have enough intelligence to try and get a good grip on me to reverse the situation. So, I just swung him around and threw him towards the group of villains. He crashed into the men like a cannonball. There was nothing the poor villains could do besides getting crushed by his body. The villains around me must have realized that I wasn't exactly going to be helping them during this raid. So they also decided to encircle me. A grave mistake. I guess I need to show them why I'm so famous. I then stamped on the ground with great force, using my earth manipulation quirk, and creating a large wave that washed over at least 30 villains at the same time. They were all either crushed under the weight of the wave or catapulted into the air, leading to quite a bad fall and a few broken bones. I can't really send it towards more villains because it might also affect Scarf Dude and Toga. So I will just take out as many as I can before Sama rushes me. Then, my hand bulked up further, becoming like a rounded balloon as I pointed my palm into the crowd of villains. I let off a powerful air cannon, the pressurized crushing the ground and sending all of the villains in front of me flying. With those moves, I took out at least 70 villains. They won't be able to re-enter the fight either. I would have taken out more if they were a bit closer together. But Toga and Scarfy can deal with the rest. Salma is already up and running towards me. I didn't really catch him with the air cannon, so he's quite close to me. I just pointed a finger at him and turned it in a gun barrel. I shot his chest, creating a baseball-sized hole in the middle of it, and staggering him to the ground. The hole healed quickly, I dashed in front of Sama, as he was struggling to get back up and knead him in the abdomen. The shockwave of which sent most of the injured villains around us flying in different directions. Then, just as Sama was about to punch my side, I stepped back and allowed his punch to pass by in front of my chest, before kicking him into the gut and sending him flying further. Straight into what seems like a lake? Why is there a lake in a building? Oh well, it's here so I might as well use it. I used Nao's quirk, which I copied from him at some point, to encase Salma in a prison of water of sorts. 
It was basically a large bolt that would permanently pull him towards the center. A whirlpool of sorts that was in constant motion and didn't allow Sama to gather his strength to properly escape. I did use like half the lake for it, so it better be enough. I then looked back. Someone was scratching my back while I was concentrating on trapping Sama. It seems little Shiggy also wants to play around a bit. He's disintegrated some parts of my exoskeleton, but they are healing just as quickly as he destroys them. I just kicked him into the gut and sent him flying back into the crowd of villains. Which, might I add, was quickly becoming smaller and smaller. Some of the students also joined and started helping by taking out the cannon fodder. The explosion kid is also awake now, and taking out his anger on a few unfortunate thugs. Another kid is freezing a lot of them alive. And, before I knew it, the fight was over. Well, mostly. Sama managed to punch its way out of my prison. Nomu. Take me away from here. Does Shigi really think I'll let him get away from me? I mean, the Sama Nomu isn't really a threat to me, it's just got endurance. Sama tried to run towards the downed leader, only to get kicked in the face by yours truly. He did technically try to run past me. I obviously won't let him do that. Well, this is entertaining, I could see some of the students cringe when I turned Sama's body in a skipping stone on the lake. Shigaraki slowly got up and shakily started walking towards me. W.Y.? W. We were so close why did yo I appeared in front of him and looked him in the eyes. This plan is stupid so is your dream I've nothing against you, but all for one will have to die, he stared back into my eyes, flabbergasted. You're nothing but a tool to him, I won't kill you at least if you stop fighting, I don't do charity. T teacher? I I see so it was all a joke then, what am I even doing here? He grasped his hair and looked at the ground in despair. I didn't actually think he would believe me. But I guess I did plant a few seeds in his mind. The uncaring nature of his loving teacher isn't really well hidden when Shigaraki isn't present. I made sure that he knew that. Ever since I stopped pretending not to be able to talk. Overall, his loyalty to all for one is strong, but his mind is so unstable that a single shred of doubt can crush his reality as a whole. I'm not great when dealing with people, and manipulation has never really been my thing. But I can pull something like this off if I really put my mind to it. Well, thing or going we the entrance door was suddenly punched open. In entered an angry looking all might, he wasn't wearing his hero costume, but he was still ready to fight. It's fine now. I am here. I guess the students getting involved in this is the cause of his anger. Then, he looked down, there were still a few villains left. He just dashed in and took them all out in less than a second. Then started looking for any injured students, he heaved a sigh of relief when seeing that everyone was intact. What happened her he was about to ask the scarf hero before his eyes finally landed on me. Toga had also come to my side, asking if she did a good job. I just patted her head a bit and told her to stand behind me. Great to see you, I said while staring at the symbol of peace. Beru have you finally finished? I apologize for injuring you back then, I am glad you've recovered. All Might regained his smile and started speaking to me for a bit. Don't worry, the injury wasn't that big a deal. Could have been worse glad to see you're still he, I didn't even get to finish when I noticed some blood dribble down on his chin. He was unsteady and seemed to only be able to hold himself up. I guess he's not really as healthy as he appeared to be thankfully, he has his back turned on the students. My revenge is mostly done, only one last person needs to appear, I said as my antennas danced around in the wind. You should also rest a bee, I was about to tell All Might to go and get checked up or something, but Salma decided this would be a good time to crawl out of the lake. POV narration All of the students were expecting a fight to break out when the symbol of peace appeared. After all, Beru was titled the arch nemesis of the symbol they thought he just helped them on a whim or something. They didn't expect Beru and All Might to just start chatting. The students just stared blankly as the supposed rivals didn't even show a hint of hostility to one another. Toga was just as confused as them, she thought Beru had told her to stay behind him, because a fight was going to break out, she didn't know he just didn't want her to stay near heroes. Had the media been overplaying the events to that extent? It was the only conclusion all of the people there could reach. They clearly weren't enemies at all. The Nomu came out of the pool sluggishly. Shigaraki's last orders were still what it was trying to achieve, but its energy was drained completely. It couldn't do anything when Beru pointed his finger at it again and blew off both of its legs. The recovery speed was slowed down greatly. It was already out of the fight. Soon, the other teachers also arrived. And Beru still stood around the unconscious Shigaraki and waited. POV Beru as I stood around Shigaraki and waited, a few of the heroes came towards me. That and, a strange white rat looking fellow. Is he a rat though? Or is he a bear? Hmm, am I a mouse? A dog? A bear? The answer is he came closer to introduce himself to me. Who thinks he looks like a dog though? I can't really see the resemblance at all. I am Nezu, the principal. He raised his hands dramatically. 
Um, that didn't really answer any of the questions that he put or that were on my mind. But whatever, I'll roll with it. I'm Beru Certified Insect Man and Couch Potato, I can't really think of a more formal way to introduce myself, to be honest. He just looked at me for a bit, the smile on his face not disappearing at all. The rest of the teachers gave the two of us a blank stare. A weird looking guy, I think he's just a square or something. Raised the ground around all might and started creating a barrier between him and the students. I guess he needs to make his way out of here without the students noticing something's wrong? I mean, they are all somewhat fixated on me and the teachers now anyway. That's a strange introduction. Nice to finally meet you though. Like you're one to talk. Hmm, maybe I should also start introducing myself as he does. Am I an ant? A man? A T-Rex? The answer is I am Beru. Hmm, something's missing. I guess it's not exactly correct since I didn't use that dinosaur quirk at all since I got it. I just forgot about it honestly. And the novelty of it kinda vanished at some point. Great to meet you I bent down a bit and shook his small hand paw. I'll go with paw. Well then mind telling us what exactly you are waiting for here? I believe we should know such things. He finally got to the point. Technically, the fight might happen on his turf. He should evacuate the place properly in advance. Waiting for Shigaraki over here to either get teleported away or for all for one to come here. The first scenario is the most likely to happen. This is why I've seeped some portal mist into his stomach. I can teleport wherever all for one takes him, I just need to manipulate it properly. All for one I wasn't expecting to hear that name here. He said in a somber tone. He looked quite serious all of a sudden. I guess he is somewhat famous. Or used to be anyway. He's been inactive for a long time now, at least from what I've observed. I also never heard anyone on the streets talking about him. Which is strange, but I guess he was more of a behind the scenes type. This all for one fellow does he have multiple quirks? He asked cautiously. Some of the teachers were also having similar reactions to his. Yay he's pretty strong I can take care of him though, I said in a confident tone. So, he was the one that captured you? Asked the bondage lady, I just nodded my head a few times. Me and a few other kids one of them being the Nomu that I was fighting before you all showed up, I said with a simple tone. I do have some time on my hands before all for one realizes something is wrong and teleports his successor away. What's a Nomu? If you don't mind me asking the one talking this time is the scarf hero with yellow goggles. Engineered monsters with multiple quirks I am also one, kind of I won't really go into detail about my situation though. I don't see any point in doing so. I spoke some more to the teachers and the principal. The students were already taken outside for a paramedic crew to check for any injuries. Togo was also checked upon by them and healed for a few minor injuries. Healing quirks look damn fine not gonna lie. Then I stared at the ground, as I noticed some white substance come out of Shigaraki's mouth. Shigaraki vomited a lot of that white substance, it swallowed him up and teleported him away. This is the most likely situation not gonna lie. Good thing I prepared for this. I guess I should follow after him too. That would be my cue to leave can you take care of Toga for a bit, I said as I raised Toga by the shoulders and put her in front of me. She looked a bit confused as she was being manhandled, but she'll get over it. I could teleport her somewhere, but I don't want her causing any trouble. What if she goes around stabbing people or something? I mean, I wouldn't care all that much, but I do want to live legally at some point. And since she's already attached to me, I'll have to make her live legally as well. If possible anyway. She seems to be quite bloodthirsty in nature. Kinda like me, otherwise, I guess I'll just flee the country or something. I'm not going to jail anyway, I'm still a minor, and have been ever since the beginning of my career. Legally, there isn't really all that much I can do in order to defend myself. The public will defend me as soon as my identity comes out. Especially the mutant quirk community. They are probably going to riot in the streets if I face any jail time. Do you need any assistance? The person you are about to face is extremely Dan Nezu's nice, but I have to turn him down. That's nice of you, but I've been preparing for this day for years I don't need any assistance now, I said as I waved at the heroes a bit. But the fight will most likely happen in Hosu City, I recommend you sound the alarms for that, I said as a black mist rose around me and slowly engulfed me. Hey. What about me? I can take care of myself. As expected, Toga also wants to come, but she's not really strong enough to help. Rather, she'd be more of a burden than anything I'll avoid telling her that though. It would be a bit mean of me. Don't worry it won't take me long, I said as I disappeared from the high school grounds. The heroes looked a bit hesitant to let me come here alone. But I didn't give them much time to talk about it. I mean, most of them would only become casualties if they come. I arrived in a dimly lit room. Shigaraki was on the ground behind me, still not conscious. All for one was sitting on a chair, his back turned to me. He's wearing a strange mask with tubes running all over it. He's weak? Why is he so pathetic? 
He looks so much weaker than he was before maybe it's just my imagination? It took me a while to realize that you were up to no good. But it was already far too late. It seems I must take care of you myself. He slowly got up. Does he think he's intimidating to me or something? I mean, I would take this a lot more seriously if he was not in this state. Everyone that you relied on is dead. Do you think you can beat me? I said in a distorted voice. I am not expecting to intimidate this guy with it. But I feel that it's the most appropriate. This is also the voice I had when I told him that he would die a few years back. All for one just let off a burst of maniacal laughter. Hahaha. <laughs> Do you truly think any of that matters? So what if they've died? I think I can guess the cause of his confidence, I will just gain new subordinates. But you, you on the other hand will have to die here. He still thinks I'm a bit weaker than all might he thinks he can so easily get rid of me. I guess the next moments are going to serve as a rude awakening for him. POV narration all for one didn't like the situation one bit. It had taken him a bit to realize that something was wrong, not being able to contact neither Kayadai nor Machia, also didn't help his growing distress. And, while Gigantamachia was replaceable, the same couldn't be said for the Dr. Kudai Garaki or Daruma Yujiko. The man was a genius, one that he didn't like the idea of losing. He still wasn't sure of their current states, but since he couldn't teleport either of them to him or contact them, he assumed they were deceased. He was trembling in anger while sitting on his chair. Thinking of who might have been responsible for those things. He had heard nothing about a raid from his moles in between heroes or the police. So, he was left looking at the walls for a few minutes. Until he quickly realized that his dearest student was still supposed to be trying to take down Toshinori Yagi, he quickly teleported his student back to him. Upon seeing his state, however, the whole picture just clicked together in his mind. Who exactly would be capable to get through the defenses he had prepared for Shigaraki in such a quick manner? Well, not even the symbol of peace could have gone through both the Nomu Sent and Beru. Which left him with only one explanation, Beru had defected. He had seen the insectoid act more and more strangely in the past few months. Kurajiri made sure to report everything he saw to him. Beru had gained at least a human level of intelligence, much like Kurajiri himself, but he had assumed he was just as loyal as before. That assumption fell apart now, as Beru also appeared right near his student. It was infuriating to see him just brazenly show up like that. But all for one also didn't know how Beru had even gotten there. He didn't remember trying to transport him too. But it seemed like he would have to face him now. Even if all for one was not as strong as his prime, he still held the same pride. His conversation with Beru made him even matter, the insect was even taunting him? As he got up to face him he realized something quite concerning, he couldn't even see his pupil anymore. Shigaraki was important to all for one, as it was a way to make the symbol of peace despair even more. But he didn't know what method Beru had used to take him away. Had he given Beru a teleportation quirk that he had forgotten about? That was unlikely. Well, regardless, he was going to deal with the pest, and then just call his student back. It didn't matter what tricks Beru had up his sleeve, after all, all for one was confident of crushing all of them. He would make sure to teach the insect not to bare its teeth at him. And while the fight was starting, Nezu was still contemplating his course of action. He had wanted to let Beru take care of his own revenge, as he knew how strong the insectoid was from all might. But the issue complicated itself when the identity of the captor was revealed. All for one still being alive was not great news to the principal of UA. He quickly started forming a team and informing all of the heroes in the province that something big was happening. The police were already on the streets looking for the location of the fight to start the evacuation effort. All Might had yet to be informed of what was happening. But he was in a weakened state right now, he wouldn't be of much help. POV Beru All for One decided to open up the fight by extending his fingers in my direction. The same move he had used to keep me down when I was a kid. Well, not going to work this time. I also have that move. My fingers also turned black and extended to match his. They clashed in mid-air and entangled each other, neither gained any ground as he just stared at me. Hateful bug well, he sure has more energy than I thought. It seems he still has the time to spout out kindergarten insults at me. I tugged with my arm, also pulling him towards me as he prepared a punch. I guess he's not that bad. I also prepared a punch with my free hand, putting quite a bit of force into it. Our fingers also quickly disentangled as our strikes met. He had used the momentum I had given him to power up his strike, but mine was not any weaker. Bang the shockwave released broke the warehouse around us and pushed everything away as we were locked in a staring contest. He quickly used air cannon on the punch, a move I could foresee as I already knew the telltale signs of that quirk's use. I instantly used impact recoil on my fist, and he was pushed back by his own move. Sent flying and rotating in mid-air. He came to an abrupt stop as he also used a flying quirk that he likely has. 
Maybe you are a bit stronger than I expected. Don't get over yourself. I'm just letting you get higher, so your fall will be more despairful. I can fell his body in cuts within seconds. But doing so would make this fight end quickly, something that I would find quite unsatisfactory. Less talk more fight is all I said as I also unfurled my wings and dashed towards him. He didn't really like my comment, but he was prepared to receive my kick anyway. I cut through the wind and brought my leg down on his head. He raised both his arms in a cross as he used impact recoil. That mask of his seems to be quite important. I was blasted backwards from the power of my own kick, I also rolled around in the air and broke my momentum, using my wings to stop myself completely and landing on a nearby office building. While I was flying away, he already raised his arm and started charging up an air cannon. I kicked off that building right back at him, breaking it apart in the process. I extended my claws and prepared to slash at him. And, just as he released his air cannon, I dashed to the side. Dodging the stream of compressed air as it crashed into a building and destroyed it. Then, I clawed at his extended arm, he hardened his skin using some quirk of his. But my claws still reached his muscles before he used another air cannon to push me away once more. I feel a bit sad that I can't really see his face. But he should be growing a bit more distressed right about now. The realization that this isn't exactly going to be an easy fight should have set in. Evident by his lack of verbal taunts, he's trying to focus on defeating me first. By now, I can also see the police evacuating as many people as possible. Some must have still been caught in the rubble though. At this point though, most of the people that weren't already affected should have been evacuated. Heroes should be showing up to rescue the rest any second now too. I stared at all for one, wondering how to make this more interesting for myself. His arm was already healed and he just looked at me. He landed on the ground and started preparing for another attack. I mimicked his movements by also landing and staring at him, analyzing the situation a bit. He seemed to be combining strengthening quirks in one of his arms. I guess he wants to try and see how much I can handle? Well, I can also pull off a combination like his. There's no quirk that he has and I don't, maybe a few exceptions, but physical enhancements aren't part of those. At first, he mainly gave me physical enhancements. Wanting to see just how strong my body could grow. I also decided to combine all of them into one arm. Copying every single move of his. But I also added muscular's quirk, bulking up my arm to great proportions. Jagged bones sticking out of my exoskeleton the same way they stuck out of all for one skin. I enhanced my legs too, using muscular's quirk to bolt them up and combining it with more enhancing quirks. This clash won't be a pleasant one for him. He will likely try to pull off some shit during it though. Both of us dashed towards each other. Our punches meeting and creating a shockwave that shook the entire city. The buildings around us collapsed. At first, neither of us was whining. Each one of us was winning and losing ground at a similar pace. But, slowly, I outpowered him and started pushing him back seriously. I also noticed that one of his legs was becoming much larger, almost like a balloon of muscles. Each one of my steps cracked the ground while he tried to dig his feet into the concrete street. Eventually, he raised his ballooned leg, completely losing any semblance of balance, as my punch almost crushed his hand. The entire right side of his body was harmed by my fist. But, from that raised leg, he released a powerful air cannon straight into my chest. Sending me flying backwards and crashing into quite a few buildings in the distance. My punch, however, still dealt a lot more damage to him. He was sent flying in the same way I was, but he was also gravely injured. Meanwhile, most of my injuries are already healed. The outcome of this fight is quite clear at this point I can also see that the news helicopters caught our last clash at least. There are also quite a few heroes gathering at the scene. Some of them are familiar faces even POV narration all for one didn't understand why his opponent was so powerful. At this point, he was quite confident in facing All Might too. But somehow, it seemed like every single one of his strikes was useless against Beru. They were either shrugged off or healed instantly. He didn't remember the quirks implanted into Beru to be so strong. Even when he gambled and got into a clash with him, only to use that opportunity to air cannon him, nothing happened. Beru was only pushed back, he healed almost instantly. While all for one, well, the old villain could feel his body slowly dying as his injuries accumulated. His hyper-regeneration was barely keeping him alive, and his other enhancing quirks were what kept him moving. He dragged his broken body up from the rubble of the buildings around him. He didn't know what to make of his opponent. He had thought Beru to be just like Kurajiri, but now the situation was not really favorable for him. But, he was still not losing hope. Kaidai was always a smart man, after all, he had made sure to put a fail-safe inside Beru's body. It was after they had discovered that Beru had started developing conscious thought. A powerful poison pocket that would detonate inside his stomach when all for one pressed a switch. That fail-safe was designed especially for this improbable possibility. 
The poison was actually just a cocktail of deadly chemicals, instantly capable of killing off even the strongest of foes instantly. Hyper-regeneration actually made things worse for the victim. It could only prolong their life for a few painful seconds. Delaying the inevitable and prolonging the misery of the target for around 10 seconds at most, to be exact. Now, all for one had no delusion of actually escaping, he was likely going to be captured. But, given time, he was going to recover some strength. And there was still Shigaraki and some of his other subordinates. They might not be as useful as Kaiadai and Gigantamachia, but he still had hopes of escaping. But first, he would make sure that Beru died here. All for one didn't instantly press that switch. He was going to taunt the bug that had dared to ruin his plans. POV Beru I stared at all for one as he shakily got up. I don't think he even has any strength left to clench his fists. And yet, here he is, still alive. This would be a lot more fun if he could actually feel pain. But he's more like a dead fish when it comes to reactions at this point. I mean, I expected a lot more anger. Even now, when that mask was blown clean off his face, I can't really see much anger in his EXPRESSION not that he has much of a face left. Rather, I can see a sickeningly arrogant smile etched on his lips. A reminder of why I hate this man so much. That arrogance, he always acts and feels like he's above everything and everybody. Like he's always in control of the situation. I thought I'd be able to break out some semblance of despair from him. But I guess he's just not the type. Hahaha. <laughs> I wasn't expecting him to actually laugh though. Is this fun for him? Death? I mean, sometimes killing someone can be fun. But dying certainly isn't. I'm sure this fight has caused quite a few deaths already. It can't really be helped though. All for one isn't exactly an easy opponent. No one will hold this against me well, maybe some will. But I don't care. What's so funny? I asked while staring at him. I don't really care much about him, but I guess I can humor him for a second. This fight's already over anyway. There's nothing he can do anymore. He just snickered a bit. Then his grin turned a bit sadistic. Do you really think you've won, you're nothing but a lab experiment? I guess delirium isn't all that unusual for a megalomaniac to feel in his last moments. Do you think I would let you run around without assurance, a failsafe has been made for you, you little bug. You are going to die right here. Today. Does he think I'm some kind of idiot? I mean, I'm not the smartest individual. But I obviously expected this to happen. I poisoned him with my claws, he doesn't have all that long to live either. His hyper-regeneration running on overdrive is what's keeping him from collapsing on the ground. I made preparations for this fight. I'm well aware I might have to die during it, even if I can easily beat all for one. That's also the real reason why I let off Toga with the heroes. I don't want her becoming some useless 2-bit villain. I may not know her all that well, but she's not all that bad a person. She deserves better than that. I also made sure to tip off the authorities about the location of Kaiadai's laboratory. It was a simple anonymous call just before I arrived to prepare for the raid on USJ. I advised them to have a team of powerful heroes with them too, since the Nomus will try to protect the lab no matter what. I made preparations to die here. But this guy still thinks he'll somehow survive. This is rather irritating. But I guess he has no actual way of knowing how much work I put into this. Oh well, kind of a shame that my effort will go unnoticed. I also don't really know the nature of that failsafe. I kind of relied on all for one's arrogance and his lack of knowledge of my power to get him to fight me. It would have been regretful if he used his failsafe in the beginning. But, since he didn't actually believe I would be able to beat him, he had no reason to use it. Now, everything went as planned. Let's see what he actually has up his sleeve. Suit yourself you've already lost is all I told him. But my lack of care seemed to piss him off quite a bit. Die. Die knowing that all you did was nothing more than an inconvenience to me. Poor little fool, he still has no idea of how swift his death will be. The poison I used on him is no regular snake poison. It's a combination of all of the poisonous substances I've consumed in the past. A deadly cocktail that I've not really had the chance to test. Even with his endurance, he won't be alive for a lot longer than me. He took out a small switch, it seems it was somewhere inside his mouth. I could reach him, but I wouldn't actually be able to cut his hand off before he presses it. Something else unexpected happened though. A wave of flames quickly rushed towards all for one, burning him and sending him tumbling to the ground. A hero in a dark skin tight latex suit appeared from the side. His sneak attack took all for one by surprise. After taking a closer look, he's the dude I took the fire quirk from, his flaming beard is still cool to look at. By the look on his face, he must have heard what all for one had just said. I guess he is actually a hero because he doesn't really look all that pleased. Strange, I don't remember him being friendly. Maybe he also learned of my identity or something. I don't really feel like thinking about it too much right now. 
Oh well, his assistance was nice, but All for One still has that switch in his hand, and he's even further away from me now. All for One was still injured a bit, but he pressed the switch nonetheless. He laughed a bit while staring at the fiery hero, and then right back at me. I could feel a strange burst coming from my stomach, then I felt a strange yet strangely familiar sensation wash over me. I immediately started feeling nauseous, a feeling I hadn't had in a very long time. But, for some reason, I don't really feel like I'm in danger. I was expecting some type of bomb to be planted into me, but this feels more like a toxin of sorts one that burst from a bubble in my stomach, thahaha, it was my turn to laugh. All of that preparation just for the failsafe to be something this useless, do you find your organs melting fun? What a twisted abomination you a he was quickly sent flying by a flaming kick. All for one was already in a dying state, these injuries made him not even able to get up. He just lay there, a confused look on his face. The hero from earlier finally reacting and rushing towards me too. I guess he wants to help me, but there's not much to do at all. My body is already absorbing those toxins, it won't take long before they are completely integrated into my regular poison. Shit. Are you alright geez, I wasn't expecting a hero to show this much concern. Yeah it turns out it was quite useless on me that is all I said. This hero stopped in his track and sighed a bit. I guess he took my word for it. I walked past him and crouched down to all for one, staring at him with a simple childlike joy inside me. I'm not even angry anymore, this was quite fun, I got to watch this man struggle like a worm. W what? Why are yo he opened his mouth slowly. I think he's finally started feeling the poison, as his speech got slower and his body became paralyzed. I'm immune to poison, but it was a nice try you were pathetic till the end Kaiadai's laboratory has been raided by now, just so you know I spoke calmly, as his mouth trembled. I also managed to turn little Shigaraki against you, you were a fun toy too bad you broke so easily, I said as I patted his head like I would a small child. He would have likely been infuriated for my disrespect, if not for something else taking over his body. An emotion I had never seen before on him, fear. The realization that there might truly be no way out for him. The dread, the sickening thought that this might truly be the end of you. The longer you live, the stronger that emotion gets, and this guy has lived a long enough time to feel it. I slowly got up as I heard his heart stop beating. I patted the dust off of me and stared at the hero. Thanks for the assist although it wasn't really needed, he tried to help me, that's commendable. You seem to be handling it just fine yourself, he said with a sigh as he crossed his arms. I still don't get why he's acting so friendly. But I don't care all that much. That's my revenge done. POV narration NG Todoroki was a simple man. Not really, he was a cunt, he had once lost to this infamous villain. So, he decided to look more into their identity. Their appearance was unique after all. It was first out of spite, but then it turned into curiosity, then into anger. It didn't take long for the private investigators he hired to vanish. He could not get into contact with them at all. It was as if they got erased. Even the firms they worked at claimed ignorance about ever having any employees like that. It was obvious to Endeavor that someone important didn't want the villain's identity to ever come up in casual conversation. But, while they could easily silence people trying to look into police records, they couldn't stop Endeavor from actually doing some research himself. And Endeavor himself did get a warning. One which he promptly ignored. He was the NR.2 hero, after all, there wasn't all that much they could do to him. He looked up many sources and eventually found the villain's identity. Beru's history was a well-documented series of events after all. Even if the people upstairs managed to make publications mention Beru less, some still had information about him. And they couldn't threaten that many people at once, otherwise there would be repercussions. So, information on Beru's true identity was plentiful. It was just sloppily buried under a pile of trash articles and lies. Endeavor didn't really need to jump through many loops to find out more about it. But he regretted hiring the private investigators and endangering them. Endeavor didn't know what to make of the villain now. He was a troubled teen, but calling him that would be a disservice to all of the things he went through. His past made him regret thinking of him as a monster. But there was also the fact that Beru had injured him, although not seriously in any way. It showed that Beru was in no way afraid of getting his hands dirty. A trait that the hero would usually praise in his sidekicks. But it was unnerving to see a child externalize the same actions, with even less care. Beru would remain as an enigma for Endeavor. At least for a while until he was contacted by Nezu, the principal of the hero school he attended. He learned more about his circumstances and encounters with other heroes. And that made him realize that Beru was not a dangerous individual. Nezu had revealed the information to a closely knit circle. It happened to include Endeavor because Nezu realized the government was paying attention to his actions. The principal had some degrees of political immunity and power. It was just enough to shield those around him from any unfounded accusation. 
He managed to stop some of the cases building against Endeavor from behind the scenes. In exchange, Enji would have to do his best to help Beru when the time was right. Nezu kept all of the information close to himself. But he also tried to make the real articles about his past more accessible anonymously. Leading to a larger margin of people learning about Beru's true identity. But it was in vain, as any open discussion about it seemed to disappear as soon as it cropped up. Still, the government wasn't able to do anything to Nezu, Endeavor and the rest of the teachers at UA. Now, onto more urgent matters. UA was bound to get some flack for the attack that happened through their security systems. But it wasn't going to be anything major, as none of the students was injured at all. Nezu even considered it a net positive, as the students now had some experience facing real VILLAINS even if they were just thugs. But Beru's fight against All for One is what actually shook the nation. The discovery of a villain just as dangerous as Beru, that had been hiding in plain sight the entire time. With it, more attention was brought to Beru as well, his identity being completely outed as the government couldn't silence the entire country. Everybody wanted to know the true identity of the strangely heroic villain. Some, however, were more curious about his current whereabouts. He had flown off after All for One had died, never to be seen again. Well, it had only been three days, but things were happening really quickly. People especially wanted to know about his state after his identity was found. As his past was still fresh in the minds of some of the mutant quirk activists. After all, the discrimination he faced was well documented. And his strange lack of malevolence was what intrigued many. They didn't realize how much Beru actually hated all of that attention. He felt like it was nothing more than a useless pity party. He wasn't a child, after all, he was a grown adult. And he wasn't affected all that much by what others thought of him. The only annoying part to him were the people that felt the need to vocalize their verbal garbage. The all-for-one incident wasn't without casualties. There were at least 53 people that died due to it. Some articles blamed Beru for these deaths. But many blamed the deaths on the other villain that had died that day. As Beru was clearly fighting against someone evil. He was even assisted by the NR.2 hero. To them, the incident was really black and white. Beru just found the situation amusing. The casualties were not really hanging on his consciousness, but he didn't feel all that good about them, he didn't like implicating people in his issues. Still, that was the perfect opportunity to attack all for one. Beru didn't have a way of knowing where he would send Shigaraki afterwards. If he didn't kill him that is. Shigaraki's loyalty was already waning, he had no way of knowing what all for one would do. And he needed to act quickly. Now, Beru was just resting. Relaxing in a random room inside a dormitory. Nezu had made arrangements for his stay there. It was still within the UA grounds. But his presence was a secret. As the principal knew that the government would definitely try to arrest him if they knew his location. This was just a temporary fix, however, and the principal knew it. On another note, Togo was also living in the same D-O-R-M-I-T-O-R-Y on the same floor. The schools decided against giving her to the cops after Beru said. If you try that I'll just take her and fly off Nezu decided against calling his statement a bluff. And she was not called a villain in the incident. Since she didn't have much of a previous record, she wasn't even on their radar anyway. Shigaraki on the other hand was different. His real identity was discovered, leading to All Might almost falling into a bout of depression. Tamura was, after all, the grandson of his deceased master. Something that he found harrowing, he had been in the clutches of All for One the entire time. He also didn't know what to make of All for One still being alive after their fight. It was still strangely calming to see him pass away on live television. One of the people that suffered because of him towering over him without any injury. Beru had managed to succeed where he had failed. Without any difficulty too. Although, from Endeavor's words, it wasn't all that peaceful a conflict. He told the teachers of All for One using a fail-safe against Beru. It thankfully wasn't effective, but it still made some of them uncomfortable. POV Beru so much scandal over my identity. It's a bit fun, but I'd love it if I wasn't actually a wanted man. Even if I have the minor excuse, I won't be able to escape apparently. By Nezu's words, the government has taken a special interest in me. And they'd love to be able to stuff me in a laboratory. I'm obviously not going to comply. I'd much rather tear them to shreds than spend another week in a damned laboratory. Toga has been a bit bored lately. She still asks for blood from time to time, which is quite meh at this point. It was only a bit weird the first time, now it's just normal stuff. She's always sneaking into my room at night. I usually just ignore her and let her do her thing. She usually just lays in bed near me and stares at me for a few hours before falling asleep. Why exactly am I awake the entire time? Well, I don't actually sleep a lot. Most of my night is usually me daydreaming. Kinda like I am now but I guess it's already morning, so it's time to wake up POV Berusu what exactly are you doing in my room again? 
I asked the skinny man in front of me. He is apparently called Yagi or something. I sat on my bed while this guy just entered the room. I mean, I let him in, but I don't know him well. He looks kinda like that all might dude, but skinny obviously. The hairstyle is quite similar, maybe this guy's a fan or something. I, I came here to check up on you. I was quite busy the last few days, so I was not able to do so. Yeah, but why? I don't know you. Did that all might bloke send you here? He suddenly had a look of realization on his face. He slapped his forehead and rubbed the bridge of his nose. You weren't really paying attention to Nezu's explanations were you? I mean, obviously. Why would I? It was all boring stuff anyway. I don't care about the government being after me. I mean, I listened to some stuff here and there. But I ended up dozing off quite a few times. I listened it partially anyway, I said with confidence. I I see, why does he look personally attacked? Well I am all might. You're what now? I know the guy has his fans, but it's not nice to impersonate people. I was about to give him a piece of my mind, but he suddenly inflated all of his muscles. He turned from toothpick skinny to Arnold Schwarzenegger on steroids in seconds. I just stared at him for a bit. He reverted to his skinny form after about 5 seconds. I can only keep that form for 3 hours per day. It's because of an injury I gained when fighting someone you know quite well. He said as he lifted his shirt and showed me his torso. It looked to be quite fucked honestly. I've never seen an injury this bad before. I see it was all for one right? None of the other people I know can even fight this guy, let alone injure him. It's quite the logical conclusion. This also explains the pathetic state that all for one was in. It seems he was also quite fucked by all might in return. Indeed I I wanted to thank you. And to apologize to you, he pulled a chair from the desk in my room and sat down in front of me. Why thank me and why apologize? Both are questions I can guess the answer for. But I am kinda curious. I need to thank you for this is a shameful thing to say as a hero. He took a pause and looked me in the eye. I must thank you for getting all for one off the streets. I would have preferred if he was arrested, but at least now I know that he won't rubble anyone him. That was it. It's not like I did it for him. Why is he thanking me? It was my duty to capture him once, and I let my emotions get the better of me I thank you for finishing what I started. He took a small bow. I guess it makes more sense now. I still only did it for myself though. I also gained his quirk, which is pretty neat. I mean, he didn't really have many quirks that I didn't already have. But his original quirk all for one is quite useful. JK it's folk and garbage, I know about it from Kayadai's notes I did read a few things around there to waste time only, when no one was around though, I think I basically gained an empty copy of it. Well, every quirk I have is basically a copy, but it's just as strong as the original. Just lacking all of the quirks he had gathered. And, to be honest, it's quite useless to me. I mean, I already have the ability to copy quirks. This kinda just happened to fall into my hands. I guess I'll keep it thoughgh I doubt I'll use it all that much though or at all. And, I want to apologize for failing you I want to apologize for all of the hardships you've faced, or so see I mean, it's nice that he doesn't pity me, but I don't feel the need to listen to all of it. It's not your fault a few bad apples won't always spoil the whole basket, it's in the past anyway, I don't really know how to put it for him, I don't actually care all that much. Right now, my biggest concern would be finding a job. Not looking for reasons to wallow in self-pity. I see I then Jesus he never stops thanking people. It would be annoying if he wasn't well-meaning. How's about you thank me with that drink you still owe me? That seemed to have shut him up. Aren't you a bit young to be drinking? He coughed in his palm as he said that. I just stared at him for a bit, he seemed to be sinking in his chair while under my gaze. W well, my medication doesn't really allow me to drink alcohol, how about some tea? He seemed to break first. Acceptable proposal let's go, I said as I got up. I think we'll just be going to the canteen. There aren't many students around right now, they were all given a week off after the USJ attack. Toga also jumped up from under my bed don't ask she panicked when someone entered the room, startling all might as he jumped backwards, falling on his back. Can I come too that was all she could say. As she looked at the startled all might in me. W was she there the whole time? Muttered the symbol. Don't worry, she's harmless, I said as I pulled him up and started dragging him in the direction of the canteen. She also skipped along, not even caring that she didn't receive an answer. No answer means yes to her, that much I learned by now. Eventually, we all arrived at the empty canteen. Only one person was there beside us actually, but that was just a cook. Lunch Rush I think was his nickname. Hey boss can I get a beer I shouted at the counter. The cook just looked at me strangely. This is a high show pee please ignore him, can you make us some tea? Ask All Might, ruining my fun in the process. Toga also sighed in disappointment. What kind? The cook continued by taking our orders, we all grabbed what we wanted and sat down. 
I did have to smack Toga over the head when she was about to ask if they served blood though. So what do you plan to do now? Asked Yagi as we all sat down at a random table. Not sure I'll be looking for work after the government stops trying to probe my ass, I said as I slowly sipped from my cup. Props to having mandibles, I can use them to hold the cup if I feel lazy. I could see All Might lightly sweat at my crass nature. But I can't really help it, it's how I am. Toga just giggled a bit. And what about you, young girl? Ask All Might while staring at Toga. She's quite the enigma to most of the teachers. As her past is not really talked about. I'll stick around Baru he's nice, she said while clinging to my arm. I mean, she's cute but still underage. So I just shrugged. She raised her head and whispered something like can you give me some blood? I mean, I guess doing that in public doesn't matter if it's just one guy. I cut open my palm and just poured it in her tea. The wound instantly closing up and Toga squealing a bit. All Might looked a bit startled by that, he wasn't really disgusted though. I guess he's not the type to judge. It's in her nature I can take care of her don't worry he just nodded. Toga ignored the both of us as we started talking about random shit. I talked about the way I saw villains in this country, while he told me of his encounters with some of the intelligent ones. We had a bit of fun, I got to talk about my frustrations with the incompetence of some people too. And I managed to learn that Kurajiri was alive but in a coma. Apparently, his heart had even stopped at some point during the riot. Must be why all for one couldn't teleport him there. Eventually, we ended the day by me and Toga walking back to our dorm, while All Might went home. It was all until I noticed a gaze on me from a distance. I looked directly at it, only to see a man on a building, holding a camera and staring down at me, and Toga guess I have some cleaning up to do POV Baru I don't like paparazzi, I really detest them. I've not really dealt with many of them in my career. But the few times I've happened to run into them. Well, let's just say that the body cleanup crew of our gang never ran out of business. The bunch that I met were always arrogant and annoying. One time, I was just standing in a line at the store, some celebrity also happened to be there, so the paparazzi was trying his best to rush into the store. I pulled him by the collar and dragged him in an alleyway, the rest is history. I hope I would never have to deal with that type again. But it seems I am somewhat famous now I looked at Toga, who was still walking by my side and said. I'll be right back she just nodded. She must have also noticed something wrong when I started looking around. She just kept going forward. I guess I'll meet her again at the dormitory. Purple mist came out of my mouth and completely enveloped my body. I warped myself behind that reporter paparazzi. He immediately screamed, but I clasped his mouth shut with my hand. I broke his camera and ate it. Then I took his phone out of his pocket and threw it into a trash bin in the alleyway nearby. Now, killing him in this situation might not be the best. If a reporter randomly died in front of you right after a scandal, things would look quite shitty for Nezu. Although he could deny anything, the people would still find it suspicious. And that would just be needless trouble. Instead, I will use a quirk I will ask a friend for a favor. I warped both me and the trembling reporter to Jiren's bar. I dragged him by the face towards the counter. He looked surprised to see me for a second, and then just sighed. You made quite the mess of that last mission what brings you here? I guess he lost some rep due to his association with the League of Villains. But it shouldn't be too bad since this place is still pretty populated. He also doesn't look all that mad at me. So I guess it doesn't matter. Business, I said, purposefully putting on a distorted tone. I thought you became a hero or something for a second. Well, I'm guessing that idiot is the business? He asked as he put out his cigarette and pointed at the reporter. Use your quirk on him we'll discuss payment later, I said as I pulled his head on the counter. It's still only been around two minutes since I've appeared in front of him, so Jiren's quirk should still be useful. He let out the details of his quirk to all of his business partners. Including the league, so I would obviously know about it. He called it Mudines, it can induce light amnesia in a target, they won't be able to remember the last 5 minutes. Overall, it's a pretty useful quirk. It didn't really attract me at the time, but I guess looking for an opportunity to get it might be a good thing. Sure thing. The payment for last time's drinks should cover this much anyway. He said as he placed his hand on the reporter's head. The guy tried to struggle, but he had no way of escaping from my grasp. He kicked down a stool or two at most. Eventually, his body lost any energy as Jiren's quirk took effect. He stood still like a puppet, his eyes were empty. I think he's also salivating on the counter, which made me just throw him backwards on the ground. He will be like this for 5 more minutes, which he also won't remember. Thanks dude. I said as I snapped my fingers and pointed at him theatrically. He looked a bit startled. I guess he hasn't heard me speak normally before. But it's whatever. He just sighed and shook his head. It's a transaction don't thank me he still smiled though, so I take that as a win. Although he could use a dentist, he has that telltale British smile about him. 
Missing teeth, two of Jiren's goons were already rearranging the stools I'll head out now see you when I see you, I said as I waved at him and warped me and my victim out of there. He just raised his hand while wiping the counter. I warped me and my new friend back to the, the top of that building. I then received a great idea. I threw him off into one of the open trash bins, the same one I threw his phone in. I had to land and make sure that it was broken. His fall was cushioned by the trash, he likely only got a broken bone or two. The amnesia will explain itself. Ah, what a job well done. I dusted my hands as I flew teleported back towards the school. Then I noticed something else. The hero with the scarf. The name was Azawa if I remember correctly, he's just staring at me, white-eyed, from the other building. Well, that's awkward, I said as I also stared at him. I should have noticed him, but he wasn't here when I first grabbed a reporter, and I didn't bother checking twice. Ten minutes later, so he was just taking pictures of the campus. Asked Asawa as he sipped from his coffee cup. We are currently back at the canteen since it's the only place that serves drinks in this entire place. Although we didn't really bother lunch rush this time, we just went to a machine. Apparently, he didn't care all that much about the reporter. Well, he was a bit mad until I assured him that the reporter wasn't harmed badly. I know right. The audacity of some people I said, while my mandibles held up my coffee cup. I used my hands to support my head lazily. Hey. What you did is still wrong. But I can understand why it was necessary. We can't have many people knowing about you being in this place. He said while sighing. This is something I noticed just now, but why does this guy look so tired? I mean, I've only seen him like three to four times, and he always either looked like he wanted to die, or like he was dying, I guess being a teacher does have that effect on people. I remember making my teachers hate me all the time. I did give up in the first year of high school though, I think that piece of news was a godsend to all of my teachers. I hope you understand that I will still inform Nezu of this, Azawa said while looking at me with a serious gaze. I was going to tell him myself this isn't a good thing for you eh? If people can randomly do that then my stay here will have to end sooner than expected, I said while adopting a thinking posture. That would be quite regretful. Nezu is still trying his best to negotiate some terms with the government, but he can't do much while also shielding you. Azawa is probably one of the closest to Nezu. He knows this situation really well, and he's also doing his best to help in what way he can. He was on that building exactly because Nezu had thought of that possibility. That someone might try to spy on UA during this period. He wanted regular patrols to be held. Azawa is one of the people assigned to check on the nearby buildings from time to time. I understand but it's fine regardless of that I can handle finding a place to sleep, I said while playing with my own antennas. Besides a high school is a bit too public a place to hide me anyway, I said while looking around me for a bit. It's working now, but when the students are back here what am I supposed to do? Not leave my room? Nah. Not happening, I can handle moving out and finding a place to stay until Nezu solves this problem. But I think he might not really be able to. These fuckers seem to be quite fixated on me. It's also obvious why, but now they can use the excuse that I might be a danger to those around me. The main argument they have is the casualties from my fight with All for One. The deaths of the villains before that incident weren't really a point of concern. I think things are only going to get more annoying from here. Good thing I have my patented running away technique. I can always make like a bird and M-I-G-R-A-T-E fuck off to a different country. I would go back to the USA if only to check and see if it's still a shithole. And if the rats in New York are still that big. Oh well, I'll think about it. POV narration Toga was growing more and more bored as the days went by. It had already been four days since Beru had tea with All Might. And the students were to return to school the next day. She was not the type to stay clean for too long, she needed some blood, well, she was getting enough from Beru. But some action would be nice. Sure, she was having fun being around Beru, but she also didn't like the idea of subscribing to regular life. She knew that people like her would never be truly accepted as part of a just society. She had expected Beru to be a lot more similar to her in that aspect. But it seemed like the discrimination put against him didn't even bother him at all. He lived his day-to-day -day life without a care. And Toga struggled to understand it properly. It was something that attracted her to him. She wanted to see how exactly he could be so nonchalant about things. At first, she just thought they were the same, but then she realized that he wasn't bothered with hiding his nature at all. He flirted when he felt like IT mainly with midnight sometimes 13 too, even with his less than pleasant appearance. He cussed out others when he was bored. He sparred against All Might once or twice. Just because he felt like it. An overly violent person when dealing with OTHERS reporter incident. Togo was intrigued by how well he fit into society even with all of his flaws. She didn't like calling them flaws, it was just who he was. Just like she was bloodthirsty in nature. 
She was tired of acting as if those things were flaws. And, for Toga, being near Beru, well, it was liberating. He didn't even seem to consider her obsession with blood anything abnormal. All he needed was the simple explanation it's in my nature that she gave him. It took a few days of standing near him for her to realize why he was so unbothered. It was because he was a free man. Free from any issue, any responsibility. Just like her. But, she, who had always tried to fit in, didn't feel free at all. She had to let go of everything in her past, in order to try and find freedom in a life of crime. A place that she could act however she wanted. Before becoming a villain and meeting Beru, all she did was act like a normal person. It was stressful, tiring. And everyone around her picked on her for having a villainous quirk. She experienced discrimination, her own parents treated her like a troubled and disturbed child. It was scarring for the young Toga to see her parents look at her like that. But, she also knew of Beru's past. It was a story that was quite well known in Japan. She thought of his past to be just as, or even worse than hers in terms of the discrimination he faced and misfortune. Yet, he didn't seem troubled at all. Not burdened by any psychological scar in any way. He wasn't bothering to put on a fake smile. He didn't need any support. He was just himself. Even Nezu and the rest of the teachers found it amazing. How easily he brushed off the hardships he went through and lived life to the fullest. Now Izumi had already informed Nezu of his eccentric personality. But they weren't expecting it to be so open. Namuri was amused by his advances. She wasn't really interested in one so young though. And she also didn't find him all that attractive. Although his personality was fun. 13 was just flattered. She wasn't exactly used to getting that type of attention, she also didn't know how to respond to it. Leading to quite a few teasing sessions from both Namuri and Beru. As the two often tag teamed on the poor space hero. It had become a fun activity for Beru during the few days he had spent at UA. Still, this made the job all the more difficult for Nezu. As he simply couldn't come to a proper agreement with the officials that were interested in Beru. They were adamant about him being a danger to society. They wanted to contain him, just to create a safer world for their people. A disgusting excuse in the principal's eyes. Acting as if the teen was somehow a ravenous monster. By now, they had obviously found out about his stay at UA. But, without evidence, they couldn't do anything to Nezu. And he wouldn't let them come inside the institution to investigate as they had no right to do so. Nezu was smart. But he was not powerful enough to sway the opinion of everyone. The media played a big role in further vilifying Beru, as they often described the suffering and tragedy that had occurred that day. Even going as far as only barely naming all for one. The person that was the main reason anything even happened. It was infuriating. There was still quite a large percentage of people that didn't think badly of Beru. And Nezu still had the support of a few parties. And, recently, some officials were also being swayed by other people. Nezu didn't really know if they were members of the mutant community or not. But he knew that their actions were helping Beru. The mutant community itself was a name used to describe the representatives of mutant quirk people that faced discrimination in Japan. There was also an international organization with the same name, but Nezu doubted they would be all that interested in Japan's affairs. Still, it seemed that Beru had a few supporters in high PLACES besides Nezu. But, the people that were truly interested in Beru's ability were not budging. And, unfortunately, they were the most influential of the bunch. Namely, the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Finance and the head of the largest research institute in Japan. They were the ones with the most pull, and they were obsessed with finding and capturing Beru. The head of the research institute was currently busy, however a joint raid with both the police and heroes, revealed a hideout filled with multiple quirked experiments. That and a plethora of notes and research data left by a brilliant mind. He now had a lot of things to do, Beru taking a back seat in his mind. POV. Berusuo, boring. No reporter to be seen on rooftops. No villains trying to plan some other attack. Well, I've been having fun in this place. But I likely won't be able to stay here forever. I mean, it's nice and all. But I don't want to cause any problems to Nezu, dude's a nice rat. Odd phrase, but accurate, Toga has also been looking a bit more bored lately. I guess she does like the fact that she's getting blood from me. But I think she prefers drawing it herself. Hmm, I think I know a way to help with that. I suddenly jump out of bed. Starting the bored looking toga that had just been peacefully circling a kitchen knife on my chest till now. What's up? She asked while looking at me. Her tone was low as she also released a yawn. I just had the best idea possible. You will love it. I said with unbridled enthusiasm. I somehow doubt the first part, but I guess I trust you. Damn, she's rough when in a bad mood. Don't worry it's perfect. I grabbed her and jumped out the window. Flying directly towards the training facility I furred All Might in like two days ago. My spar with All Might was fun, but it wasn't anything like last time. 
We both obviously held back a lot more. A fist fight like that is a bit meaningless. But I'm not about to make Toga get into a fist fight with me. Hey. A bit of a warning next time. She said as we landed inside the training facility. She quickly regained her bearings though. She looked around a bit as I let her go and started preparing for my master plan. What are we even here for anyway? My knives can't even pierce your skin. She said as she sighed a bit. Well, my sweet Toga. I just had the greatest plan. I said boisterously as I extended my hand towards her. I then expanded one of the claws on my index finger to match the length and width of her kitchen knife. I used Muscular's quirk along with a few others to make it completely rigid. Then, I grabbed it and ripped it off well, I more of cut it off. She just stared at me with white eyes. W wa why huh? I was expecting a bit of excitement here you know? Her reaction kinda takes the wind out of my sails. Um, I figured you'd appreciate a sharper blade this one should be able to cut through my exoskeleton, as long as I don't use any other hardening quirks that I have. I'll leave that unsaid though. The knife may be sharp, but Toga is still a human. Suddenly. I could see the excitement in her eyes. Her bored expression turned into a large EXCITED crazed maybe, smile. Oh my god thank you thank you thank you she jumped up and hugged me. I had to throw the knife up for a few seconds, as she almost impaled herself on it. I just looked at her for a second. I already grew another finger for MYSELF hyper regen go BRRRR. It's not that big of a deal say. How about a small spar? I said as I also hugged her a BIT no reason not to. I caught the knife as it was falling down and handed it to her. She nodded her head, the same smile was apparent on her face. I'll have to restrict myself to her strength and speed though, just to make things fair. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.